Thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate your patience. I will call this uh, Senate, Minnesota Senate Transportation Committee meeting to order. Uh, today is Monday, March 4th, 2024. It's about 10 minutes after 3 o'clock. We are in room 1100 of the Minnesota Senate building. And... Uh, and in accordance, uh, a quorum is present. In accordance with the rules of the Senate, the following members will be participating remotely in today's hearing. Senator Lang from Olivia, Minnesota. Uh, members and to the public, we have uh, four uh, bills in front of us. We took two bills off. So if anyone's here for the two bills that are uh, being authored and presented by Senator Kupek, um, those are delayed to, a, to another day. Um, so we have before us uh, Senate File 3961, which um, uh, is being authored by Senator McEwen, who is unavoidably detained. I'm the second author um, on that bill, so I'm going to take a shot at presenting that bill. If uh, maybe Senator Jasinski, if you'd be so kind as to do the honors. All right. Well, that's one way to get a gavel up here. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Senator uh, Senator Dibble, uh, Senate File 3961. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and members. So Senate File 3961 um, is a is a bill that has to do with um, uh, passenger rail. I'm just going to read some. Uh, uh, Oh, first, Mr. Chair, before we start, if I could please offer the A-1 amendment. Senator Dibble offers the A-1 amendment. Explain the amendment. Uh, I'll have uh, council help explain the amendment. I think it's okay. just uh, uh, taking out a, a one, one idea around the conveyance of property. Mr. Chair and Chair Dibble, uh, that's correct. Uh, the amendment is the A-1 amendment, and it just uh, deletes the references to um, the Commissioner MnDOT uh, being able to convey property uh, for purposes of the uh, passenger rail service. Um, as I understand it, this language was also picked up in the other body when they heard uh, the subsequent provision, and um, I, I, I think MnDOT could speak to perhaps the intent behind the amendment, but uh, it is largely just removing the conveyance of property from um, the language of the bill. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dugic, anything from MnDOT you'd like to say? Uh, Mr. Chair, I think uh, Mr. Greenfield covered it pretty well. Uh, we found other ways to accomplish the same object objective, so thank you. Okay. Uh, any questions on the amendment? Senator uh, Dibble offers the A1. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Motion carries. Aye. To the bill. Um, so thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, so as uh, members might, may be aware, um, uh, Minnesota, uh, under the leadership of MnDOT, is partnering with our neighboring states uh, to support the new Twin Cities uh, to Milwaukee to Chicago uh, passenger train, um, all the way from Chicago uh, to St. Paul, kind of the, the, the infamous uh, second line from, or second train uh, from Chicago. Um, and uh, needs to, uh, needs, uh, MnDOT needs the authorization to undertake a number of activities, in, including uh, promotional activities, promotion of, of rail service and the like. Amtrak, of course, will be conducting its own promotional activities, um, but MnDOT um, needs authority to do a number of other activities, including uh, promotional uh, activities, um, providing scheduling uh, information, et cetera, and the like. Um, and so that's the, the goal of this bill in very short summary. I'll toss the ball over to Mr. Dukic to see if I covered it or if more of the description needs to be provided. Thank you, Mr. Dukic. Could you introduce yourself for the audience and proceed with your testimony? 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. For the record, my name is John Dukic. I'm with the Office of Government Affairs at MnDOT. And I think Senator Dibble did a, a good job explaining the, uh, the provision. As he said, um, we are simply seeking authority to help market and promote passenger rail service, um, which we are currently unable to do. Thank you. Uh, member questions, Senator Howe. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And do we, uh, Senator Dibble, do we know exactly how much money they're planning on using for marketing and what that marketing will entail? Senator Dibble. Um, so, uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Howe, I, I don't have that number specifically. I don't know if there's uh, been a fiscal note that's been triggered. I do know that we provide for um, the ongoing support for our passenger rail office, um, you know, fairly, you know, fairly adequately. And I think this is probably just kind of wrapped into and rolled into um, uh, the the work plan and the work program as as it was originally conceived when we provided that budgetary consideration in our bill last year. We have a permanent flow of funds, um, you know, stable source of funds that not from the Trunk Highway Fund that uh, that go to this office for a number of activities. I think this was one of them, and I think they figured out. Um, a little bit later that this specific authorization was needed, but I'll toss it to Mr. Dugic. Mr. Dugic. Yeah, Mr. Chair, Senator Dibble did a, uh, again, an excellent job of explaining uh, the intent here. Senator Hall. So, thank you, Mr. Chair. And so, the, so actually, we, we really don't have that number as far as what, is there specific events we're going to market for, or is this just a marketing in general? Is there specific time frames that we're gonna to look to try and increase passenger rail to Chicago or from Chicago? Senator Dibble or Mr. Dugic? So, Mr. Chair, I'll take a first crack. I mean, it's a fair question and uh, it deserves a specific answer and so we'll try to get, we're gonna lay this bill over for the time being and we'll try to get some detailed information about uh, you know, what the anticipated budget for this particular activity would be. I don't think it's, it's necessarily focused on events but just the normal course of doing business to uh, create greater uh, awareness of the uh, availability of passenger rail in the second train to and from uh, Chicago. Senator Hall, done? Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Dibble. You uh, voiced your concern. My concern was the trunk highway is not coming out of that, so I verified that before uh, the hearing, but thank you for confirming that, that it will not come out of trunk highway funds. Uh, we always talk about leakages, and this is one thing we would not want to see a leakage from, so thank you for that. Other, other members? <laughs> Seeing none, back to you, Senator Dibble. Uh, so with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I would, uh, I don't know if we need a motion, Council, do we need a motion just to simply lay the bill over for possible future inclusion or just say it so? <laughs> Mr. Greenfield. Mr. Chair and uh, Chair Dibble, as I, we have adopted the A1 amendment, so just motioning to lay the bill on the table would suffice. All right. As amended. So, as, uh, as amended. As amended. Yeah, so I'll make that motion. Okay, uh, Senator Dibble moves to uh, lay Senate, or actually uh, pass Senate File 3961 for possible inclusion as amended. Layover, I'm sorry, layover uh, for possible inclusion as amended. And that bill goes. Thank All right. you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Sorry, it's been a while since I chaired a meeting, I guess. So we just need to retrieve another chief author. It's a busy time. He's in another committee right now. Welcome to Transportation, Senator Fate. Thank you so much. So 
So Senator Fate, just proceed whenever is whenever suits you. Awesome. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Chair Dibble, uh, members of the committee. Uh, I'm here to present SF 4183, uh, which is the Calm Plan Clarity Bill. Uh, this is a bill that will defend the Minnesota Environmental Rights Act, or MIRA, from misuse. Uh, MIRA is the cornerstone of our environmental law in Minnesota, uh, but we need to add clarity to it to ensure that it is used to improve our environment and not hurt it. Uh, the context of this bill is that the loss is that the Minneapolis 2040 comprehensive plan has been halted uh, uh, due to a lawsuit. Uh, the 2040 plan is a landmark accomplishment uh, that has been recognized across the country for reduci reducing housing costs and reducing carbon pollution by enabling more people to live in a central city. Uh, but due to this lawsuit, it, it has been halted in its tracks. Uh, projects that were already far along in the building process and that have spent tens of thousands of dollars were abruptly canceled and left in limbo. Uh, hundreds of homes that could be housing people have been canceled. Uh, the cancellation of those homes is bad for Minneapolis, bad for Minnesota, bad for our tax base, bad for our homelessness crisis, and most relevantly to MIRA, it's bad for our environment. Uh, last year, I put forward a bill that would have addressed this problem by exempting comprehensive plans from MIRA altogether. Uh, this version is a compromise that retains the ability for people to sue comp plans under MIRA, but clarifies that residential density by itself does not constitute uh, pollution or impairment. Uh, at, the time, at the same time, it formally adopts findings that we should act to reduce climate change and that we should prevent habitat destruction on undeveloped land. Uh, this bill is a top priority for the city of Minneapolis, uh, but it's not, just me, it's not just a Minneapolis issue. Any city in the metro could be sued on the same basis that Minneapolis was. Uh, that is why the League of Minnesota Cities, the, Amer the Association of Metropolitan Municipalities, and the American Planning Association are strong supporters as well. Uh, this bill is, was also endorsed by over a dozen envir environmental organizations, and joining me today is a representative from one of those organizations, uh, Peter Virginius from Sierra Club. Uh, thank you. Welcome, Mr. Virginius. Please proceed whenever is convenient for you. I may need to do this without the presentation because the Zoom call is not coming up for me. I believe you have a paper version of the, or maybe we could have Peggy Sue go first and then I could go after Peggy Sue. I'm sorry, Peggy Sue, Emily right. Bean. In the meantime, I think yes. uh, Ms. Ethier can probably solve our technology problem from here. I'm going to put your slideshow up and I could advance the slides if you tell me when to go to the next one. Excellent. So we'll just pause for one second and wait for that. All right, go ahead. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of Sierra Club North Star Chapter. The Sierra Club is the nation's oldest and largest grassroots environmental organization representing 50,000 members and supporters across the state. I've submitted a letter from 12 environmental organizations in, in support of Senate File 4183. Next slide. And they're listed there. Our support is grounded in data about, sorry, our support is grounded in data about city populations and how they relate to the environment. Between 1950 and the 1990s, many cities in the metro area lost population due to the decrease in the number of people per household. The same pattern repeated all around the country. In 1950, the average household was 3.5. Next slide. But by 2020, it dropped dramatically to just 2.6. For cities to have maintained their populations, they would have had to have increased the number of housing units. It's just math. But many cities went in the opposite direction. Slide. Housing production has not kept up. Fortunately, cities in our region turned the tide. Thanks to thoughtful planning and planners, cities have been restoring their populations by adding housing units. 
Regaining lost population over these past two decades in older cities stabilizes property tax base, supports basic services, and it also reduces emissions. But despite all the population growth of the past two decades, slide, at least seven municipalities are still underneath their previous peak populations. They should not be prevented from making further progress. To their great credit, many suburban cities, slide, from Hopkins, Stillwater, Chaska, slide, North St. Paul, Stillwater, slide. They are seeking to grow or revitalize pre-war downtowns or main streets, slide, and doing so with new multi-story housing, slide, that allows new housing that allows residents to walk to local businesses, slide. Other suburban cities like Burnsville, St. Louis Park, slide, and Arden Hills are creating new downtowns and main streets also, again, with new housing. Slide, city leaders in these communities recognize that young adults should be able to afford to live in the communities they grew up in. Slide, and senior citizens shouldn't have to move out of local communities when they need to downsize. Slide. City leaders should be able to plan for the full life cycle of their residents, and when they are able to do so, slide, these cities are also helping to reduce climate pollution. Slide. They should be able to do so without the fear of litigation based on misinformation. And take a couple of slides up to the graph from MnDOT. There we go. The number one source of climate emissions for Minnesota and the nation is transportation. Our land use policies force more people to be dependent on car travel and to also have to drive longer and longer distances. In the transportation options and vehicle miles traveled field guide, previous slide, MnDOT acknowledged, uh, MnDOT ranked land use patterns as the most impactful by far. Notably, MnDOT ranked land use number one even while breaking out parking policy as a separate category. Higher climate emissions in low density sprawling areas are due to a long list of factors including not just longer driving distances but less access to transit, less walkability, less heating and cooling efficiencies from multifamily housing, and the greater carbon intensity of building new infrastructure to connect people who are further apart from one another. The findings at the beginning of Senate File 4183 are based on years, sometimes decades of research, which shows that where people live makes a huge impact on how much they are forced to pollute. Populations living in denser areas have choices to be able to pollute much less per capita. This is not new information, slide. We've known for a long time that destroying more and more natural and undeveloped lands year after year is detrimental to the environment, slide. We also know that per capita geographic distribution of carbon dioxide was mapped by the Center for Neighborhood Technology as far back as 2005. This is an example from the Chicago area. More recently, New York Times published an article called The Climate Impact of Your Neighborhood Mapped with an interactive map which allows anyone, slide, to look at their area. Slide. And then we'll take a closer look. The close-in view of the Minneapolis-St. Paul area is the next slide. So let's compare that, and this will be our last slide, to the map on the, that I previously showed you showing at least 11 municipalities which are still collectively 126,000 people underneath their previous peak populations. So having gone through this, imagine the climate impact of these cities being able to restore their previous peak populations versus having to unearth land at the periphery of the region to house 126,000 people. It's not even close. Unfortunately, the work to sustainably plan cities in Minnesota is now threatened. The ability to plan for infill development is vital to reducing emissions and protecting natural lands. The litigation over Minneapolis 2040, uh, due to that litigation, all cities, uh, from Richfield to Roseville, St. Louis Park to Stillwater are at risk of bad faith lawsuits based on a faulty analysis of the relationship of land use to climate emissions. The litigation has gone on far too long without resolution and it needs to be, the legislature needs to provide clarity on comp plans in a way that is grounded in both the reality of climate emissions and in how comprehensive plans work. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wiginius. Um, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself uh, for the record and proceed with your testimony. Great. Well, thank you, Senator Fateh, Chair Dibble, and members of the committee for this opportunity to testify. 
I'm Peggy Suamihi Bean. I'm a certified planner. I work for the city of Hopkins, and I'm the current president of the Minnesota chapter of the American Planning Association. We're an association that represents over 900 planners all across the state of Minnesota, and this is a really important issue to us. Good planning works to ensure that people of all walks of life can meet their daily needs in the places where they choose to live. This includes planning for neighborhoods where homes, jobs, and amenities are built efficiently, cohesively, and thoughtfully. Comprehensive planning seeks to build a variety of environments from urban to suburban that are responsive to the needs and desires of residents. This includes planning for compact communities where appropriate, which are good for the environment because they lessen emissions from transportation, reduce impervious surfaces, and protect natural landscapes and farmland from sprawl. Efforts to plan for this type of market-demanded, undersupplied neighborhood are now under threat due to, an, due to this ambiguity in law. What started as a local policy dispute in the city of Minneapolis has become an explicit threat to all planning activities in the metro region and perhaps the state. Every 10 years, municipalities in the seven county metro region are required by the Metropolitan Land Planning Act, or MP, MLPA, to engage in comprehensive planning efforts. Statute already requires that these plans must account for the population growth in a sustainable way. These plans are then reviewed by the environmental experts at the Met Council before being approved. Comprehensive plans through their design capture a wide range of community sentiment for the future through many hours and months of resident participation. At their end, they are not mandates, nor are they formal development proposals, but rather a community-led vision designed to be flexible and responsive to changing conditions. As such, they are completely unsuited for evaluation by a formal environmental process, like an EIS or AUAR, which is intended for specific projects. The legislature recognized this when it exempted comprehensive plans under the Minnesota Environmental Policy Act, or MEPA and when it required that comprehensive plans undergo their own special review process through the Metropolitan Council. Unfortunately, comprehensive plans were not mentioned in the Minnesota Environmental Rights Act. And this absence has led to a legal precedent whereby any community in the metro region may now be forced to do a costly and lengthy formal environmental review of their mandatory comprehensive plan. Should just one <laughs> aggrieved resident demand that they do this? Taxpayers should not be on the hook for costly and irrelevant environmental review or associated lawsuits. This was not what the legislature intended when it passed the MLPA. If left unaddressed, this precedent would force local planners to choose between planning for growth and community needs while risking a time-consuming and costly mural lawsuit or trying to ignore the MPLA in order to avoid legal trouble. This is untenable, and today we ask legislators to remove any ambiguity in this law and correct the issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we'll go to uh, Craig Johnson from the League of Minnesota Cities. And after Craig Johnson will be Nick Erickson from Housing First Minnesota. Welcome, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Craig Johnson with the League of Minnesota Cities. We are the statewide association of cities with uh, 838 members uh, in the state. Uh, here representing those members today to discuss this briefly, and I'm not going to repeat the things you already just heard but the comp planning process is a process used statewide by cities and required to be used by all cities in the metro area. So what happened in the case of Minneapolis could happen to any of these cities, and we do not believe that it is an appropriate use of the Minnesota Environmental Rights Act to require environmental review on theoretical plans for just general use of an area. Environmental review happens project-specific, when you know what the project will be, where it will be, and can correctly evaluate what its environmental impacts would be. So with that, we very much appreciate the efforts of Senator Fate and the committee in taking the time to look at this. We do support the bill and uh, look forward to uh, potentially in the future discussing ways to prevent other aspects of comp plans from being similarly challenged. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Johnson. Um, We'll call on Nick Erickson from Housing First Minnesota, and then after him will be Dan McConnell from the Minneapolis Building and Construction Trades Council. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and then proceed with your testimony. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Nick Erickson. I'm Senior Director of Housing Policy for Housing First Minnesota. Uh, our organization represents the builders, remodelers, and trade partners that build the places and communities that we all call home. Uh, this bill is an important step forward in helping our state address its housing crisis. With a 106,000 housing unit deficit in our state, uh, which is felt most acutely in the Twin Cities with 72% of the state's missing housing, uh, we need broad-based reforms to address this issue, and the bill before you today is a critical step in that journey. Uh, Minnesota cannot solve its housing crisis without closing the loopholes that have been abused to block needed housing. If, un if left unchecked, Mira's well-intended purpose will be used to further uh, grow the housing issue. Uh, as written, this bill is a critical, important first step, yet other loopholes will still remain. Going forward, I would recommend that you do look into exempting buy right and comp plan compliant projects uh, from additional uh, informative environmental reviews, uh, especially when these new housing projects are energy efficient ha new housing and comply with all applicable state, local, and federal environmental regulations. Uh, I know it's a busy committee, so I'll wrap it up. Uh, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. McConnell next, and then after Mr. McConnell will be Thomas Herzog from Good Neighbor Homes. Welcome. Please Thank introduce you. yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Chair Dibble, and members of the committee, Dan McConnell. I'm a business manager of the Minneapolis Building and Construction Trades Council. I represent seven, uh, 14,000. Uh, union construction workers in the western metropolitan area. Uh, since uh, this lawsuit uh, was enacted and uh, the stay was placed on the, on the plan, uh, we've seen a tremendous slide in the amount of work our members have uh, been undertaking in the city of Minneapolis and uh, strongly support this fix to the bill so that we can put an end to that. Thank you so much. Short and sweet. We like that. <laughs> That doesn't mean other people can like use his time that he really questioned. <laughs> All right, so uh, I see Mr. Herzog approaching, and after Mr. Herzog will be Sandra Rieger. Hello, good. How are you? Welcome to the committee. Please uh, introduce yourself for the record and proceed. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Chair Dibble, uh, and members of the Senate Transportation Committee. My name is Thomas Herzog. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk with you all today. I'm here in support of Senate File 4183, a bill that will help our state uh, continue to sustainably develop cities uh, while upholding important environmental protections that we enjoy today. Um, I run a small development shop called Good Neighbor Homes, and I'm here today uh, because our path to a more sustainable Minnesota is at risk uh, if we don't get clarity from the state around comprehensive plans. Uh, human caused. Human-caused climate change is a very real threat uh, to the health and safety of our state. I'm part of a small sustainable development collaborative. Uh, I build small residential buildings in urban areas. In part, I do that because I know it's fundamentally better for our environment and our transportation systems because when we build more homes on less land, more neighbors can share walls, reduce their heating and cooling needs and their bills. And they're more likely to live in amenity-rich neighborhoods where they can walk, bike, or take transit, uh, which helps them reduce the amount of car trips and CO2 emissions as they live their lives. Uh, helps them reduce these far more than if they lived on the edge of the metro area in low-density areas. Unfortunately, this type of infill development that's good for our climate, good for our economy, and good for our human health, uh, it, it's threatened because faux environmentalists have brought litigation against the city uh, just for attempting to increase its residential density uh, just when we need it most. Not only do I have uh, affordable housing projects, some of which are in North Minneapolis, an area that arguably needs more housing investment than any, uh, these projects are net zero in their energy consumption, which means they will produce as much as they consume in a year. These are the types of projects that will help us transition to a, glee, a, cre <laughs> a clean, green economy, uh, not lawsuits that force unnecessary environmental reviews for things that may never happen. Uh, every city in the metro faces the same risk, 
And if we continue, if we continue to build low density developments on the edge of the metro, we're going to find ourselves with worse traffic problems, more traffic deaths, dirtier air, and a less healthy population, and a less sustainable economy in the state of Minnesota. Senate File 4183 offers us a clear path to continue building in the urban core where we can continue to reduce vehicle miles traveled, reduce emissions, and continue our transition to a more sustainable place. Uh, we must not allow our environmental laws to be weaponized uh, against the environment itself. I urge you to please support Senate File 4183. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Herzog. Uh, Sandra Rieger is up next, followed by Nakima Levy-Armstrong. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and then proceed. You. Senator Dibble and members of the Senate Transportation Committee, my name is Sandra Rieger and my testimony is in support of Senate File 4183, a bill that will allow higher density in urban areas in sustainable ways to support healthier living. A little bit more about me. I was born and raised in the state of Minnesota and since moving to Minneapolis 22 years ago, I have lived in the urban core. I experience firsthand and on a daily basis the environmentally responsible and vibrant lifestyle living in a dense area supports. In years past and during my younger student and professional careers, I lived in affordable apartment and condo buildings which allowed me to be a regular commuter on both bus and light rail systems. When choosing a new home in the city, proximity to bus stops was always high on my list and were just a few steps from my front door. Although my current career doesn't require me to commute downtown for work five days a week, I know I have public transportation as a nearby option if I want to catch a show or a sporting event downtown. Also important to my family and me is being a short distance to grocery and retail, restaurants and coffee shops, cultural and green spaces. You would think that living in a densely populated urban core would actually mean less connection, but instead I feel even more connected to my beloved neighborhood and local businesses, knowing I'll likely run into my favorite employees, friends, or coworkers. Multiply this by the majority of residents in the community having similar routines and you now have a sustainable, healthy, local ecosystem that also positively impacts our greater environment in that local residents have lower carbon footprints with neighborhood amenities nearby. Public transportation, trails, and sidewalks help many of us arrive at our destinations without even having to get into a vehicle. In my professional life, I'm a licensed real estate broker and I specialize in the Twin Cities metro area and I'm deeply invested in my local community. In my practice, I've come across situations in which allowing higher density in cities uh, in sustainable ways could support a higher quality of life for residents. For instance, there are city residents living in single family homes who are at the age in which they need to downsize and they desire to stay rooted in the communities that they love and where they already have strong social, social ties. Unfortunately, many have to move to new cities further away due to limited affordable multifamily housing options for our senior community, resulting in increased reliability on vehicles that travel longer distances for visits with family and friends. Many think higher density leveraging existing infrastructure to promote healthier living only applies to large cities like Minneapolis, but this also applies to the greater Twin Cities Metro. I recently came across a situation where a young couple with young children was exploring the idea of building a mother-in-law suite in their lower level or an accessory dwelling unit on their property in the greater Twin Cities area so that their aging mother could conveniently and safely spend more time with their family. But their local zoning code does not allow for a separate apartment in the lower level of the home and also mandates a minimum of 10 acres for a single dwelling. 
Due to these restrictions, this family cannot afford to or comfortably realize their multi-generational household, and instead, they and their mother have to drive 30 to 45 minutes each way to visit on a regular basis, increasing their carbon footprints. These are specific examples of how allowing healthier living density in cities following updated development guidelines can promote sustainability to combat global warming. I'm also the co-founder of the Sustainable Developer Collaborative um, here in Minneapolis. We are an interdisciplinary group of about 80 members, and we are focused on developing smaller uh, housing uh, buildings in uh, infill uh, development areas so that we have easier access to public transportation and local amenities. Um, our group is focused on developing sustainably with e and we're rooted in ESG values. Um, in conclusion, as a lifelong Minnesota resident, I have often been proud of our state and the precedent set for other states to model. Passing Senate File 4183 is a hugely important step to continue laying the foundation for more just, healthy, and sustainable futures for our residents and the, the, and the cities that they live in, other states that choose to adopt similar practices, and the world that we leave behind for generations to come. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Nakima Levy-Armstrong, followed by Tim Keen. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Please introduce yourself and then proceed. Good afternoon, Chair Dibble and, and committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony in opposition to Senate File 4183. My name is Nakima Levy Armstrong, and I'm a civil rights attorney, former law professor, and community leader who resides in North Minneapolis. I also serve as co-counsel for plaintiffs in an environmental law case called Smart Growth versus the City of Minneapolis. Our purpose in filing a lawsuit on behalf of Smart Growth, comprised of Minneapolis residents, was to ensure that the City of Minneapolis was compliant with MIRA, the Minnesota Environmental Rights Act, in its implementation of the 2040 plan. I provided written testimony on a similar bill introduced during the last legislative session. This current bill is no less of a threat to MIRA than last year's bill. It guts the rights of over half of Minnesotans. Governmental bodies such as the city of Minneapolis must be held to the standard of following environmental laws regarding development. So much is at stake when governments are allowed to jeopardize the health, safety, and quality of life of individuals, children, families, and communities by failing to follow environmental laws. I have significant concerns regarding whether this bill will have the unintended consequence of undermining the applicability of environmental laws toward governmental bodies, such as the city of Minneapolis, which had a duty to ensure compliance with MIRA and MEPA laws before beginning implementation of its 2040 plan. Again, governments need to be held to the standard of following environmental laws, and the best time for that to occur is during the development phase of a plan, such as the 2040 plan. Before a plan is implemented is the only time to properly assess and prevent cumulative harm by comp plans. Only a government can be held responsible for cumulative harms. Plus, the Supreme Court in 2021 and the Court of Appeals in 2022 have both agreed that there are environmental consequences arising from such plans, and the best, if not only time to address them, is before they are implemented. Another reason why enforcement of compliance with environmental laws by the government is so important is the disparate impact that environmental injustices have on people of color and on low-income people. According to a 2020 report by Princeton Student Climate Initiative, communities of color are disproportionately victimized by environmental hazards and are far, far more likely to live in areas with heavy pollution. People of color are more likely to die of environmental causes, and more than half of the people who live close to hazardous waste are people of color. 
Prior to me moving to the Camden community in North Minneapolis, I lived in the Hawthorne community of North Minneapolis, which is a low-income community of color, which also has one of the highest cancer and asthma rates in the state of Minnesota. No one showed up to save the people of that community from those environmental impacts and consequences to their health. Thus, we know that people of color will be disproportionately impacted when governmental bodies are allowed to not comply with environmental laws. If this bill is enacted, those same communities will find it difficult to garner the resources to challenge a city hall or a corporate constituent that violates environmental laws. As a matter of fact, I reached out numerous times last year to discuss this bill with Senator Fatah, who I've known for many years, and I did not receive a, a, a single return phone call or text. If I'm having trouble receiving a response, imagine the average family member or community of color, person of color, trying to get assistance and have their voices be heard. This is a matter that deserves more significant attention and there needs to be accountability. For these communities, there is no possibility of environmental justice without accountability. There is no environmental accountability without Mira. I welcome the opportunity once again to talk to Senator Fatah and anyone who is willing to hear me and others out about this bill. I feel the weight of this situation and I really ask this committee to dive deeply before moving forward with what the city of Minneapolis is trying to do, which is to skirt environmental protections for Minnesotans. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, Tim Keene is next, followed by David Hartwell. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record. Proceed. Thank you. Uh, Senator Dibble, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Tim Keene. Uh, I appear as a resident, a lifetime resident of the city of Minneapolis, uh, where I practice real estate and land use law. My comments are mine, offered as a Minneapolis resident, and do not reflect the views of my employer or any other organization. By way of background, uh, I have been a, a previously a city planner, member of the American Institute of City Planners, certified planners, uh, served as a zoning administrator and city attorney throughout my career. My work has been dedicated to the intersection of land use development, land planning, zoning, and environmental regulations. I can't disagree with any of the testimony that has uh, preceded here. There's no doubt. Uh, as a city and state, we need to produce more housing to accommodate regional growth and meet affordability goals. New housing must efficiently utilize existing investments of infrastructure and integrate with regional systems. The 2040 plan, however, to accommodate 150,000 additional dwelling units within the city of Minneapolis as a matter of right requires a massive change in planning and zoning assumptions. Reminder, the environmental impact statement threshold uh, for projects, single projects, is 1,000 units detached, 1,500 units attached. This plan proposes 150,000 units as a matter of right. The 2040 plan is not based on a rigorous analysis of its impacts or unintended environmental consequences. Rather, it's based upon slogans and aphorisms. Like the old saying goes, trust me, I'm from the government. Why wouldn't the city want to fully evaluate the environmental consequences of this drastic plan? Increase in hardcover, Re reduction in tree canopy, loss of vegetation. Since the Minnesota Supreme Court ruled supporting the application of MIRA to comprehensive plans, Minneapolis could have completed the environmental review many times over. Senate File 4183 does not have its origins in sound policy, environmental stewardship, or empirical analysis. Rather, this amendment is a desperate effort by the city to end, uh, do an end run on the Minnesota Supreme Court's determination, unanimous determination, 
that the city must consider the environmental consequences of this massive change in land use policy. Minnesota Environmental Rights Act is a landmark law that has served Minnesota well for over 50 years. Carving up Mera in this fashion is bad policy and sets a bad precedent. When's the next car what's gonna bring the next carve up? Uh, mining for rare earth materials because it's a good thing. Uh, changes in uh, solid waste because it's environmentally uh, presumptive good. No, we have to consider the environmental consequences of these major actions and I respectfully request that this committee reject Senate file 4183. Thank you. Stand for questions. Thank you very much. So next we have David Hartwell, followed by uh, Jay Rajaratnam. Good afternoon and thank you. Uh, Welcome, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Yes, Senator Dibble and committee members, my name's David Hartwell. I'm a close to lifetime resident of the city of Minneapolis. I've had a business career, uh, exited a successful composites business in 2015. I serve on the boards of numerous uh, privately held companies, including two that would benefit greatly by increased density in Minneapolis uh, uh, with building products. But I'm also an environmentalist. Um, I've spent a good part of my career doing environmental work, uh, doing land protection. Um, Senator Dibble knows I've, I've spent a lot of time working on the legacy amendment to get it passed and, and serve on the Lassard Sam's Council since it was passed. Uh, I take offense to people who say that the effort uh, uh, is to, to have the city of Minneapolis consider the environmental consequences before they build out the city is some radical environmentalist uh, going off the, the deep end. The real question is why in the world does the city of Minneapolis not want to understand the consequences of something as fundamentally changing as the 2040 plan. Why don't they want to understand what the reduction in tree canopy, what the increased air pollution, what the increased runoff will do before they go and do it? Otherwise, we're going to clean up the messes later. We ought to understand and figure out how in the world we can mitigate that while we increase density. And we need to increase density, and we need to increase housing and affordable housing. And nobody's against that. Um, but doing it without fully understanding what it means and what the consequences are doesn't make any sense. Um, and I would ask you to reject the effort of the city to, to not take into consideration uh, the consequences of this and what it would mean to the state if other cities are also allowed to just develop and not consider environmental consequences. Um, it's a huge mistake, and I urge you not to let the city of Minneapolis get away with this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we have uh, Jay Rajaratnam. Hopefully I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Please correct me when you come forward. Hi. That is a good pronunciation. Thank you. All right. All right. Well, you have to say it anyways because you have to introduce yourself for the tape uh, and then proceed. Sure. Uh, my name is Jay Rajaratnam, um, and Chair Dibble and members of the uh, Senate Transportation Committee, thank you for letting me speak with you all directly here today. I'm here to support Senate File 4183, a bill that will help our state continue to develop uh, sustainable um, while upholding important environmental uh, um, protections that we enjoy today. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is Jay Rajaratnam. Uh, I am a developer, a small-time developer, and a co-founder of SDC, Sustainable Developer Collaborative. Um, and I'm here today because I strongly believe in building sustainable multifamily housing for our future. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I am a developer. Uh, I was born and raised until the age of eight in Sri Lanka, a small tropical island south of India. Today, my extended family members are feeling the impact of climate change from extreme heat and monsoons and changes in fishing patterns as we are you know, somewhat feeling the impacts here today. Um, 
I am currently uh, developing an all-electric uh, Department of Energy net zero ready transit oriented affordable multifamily housing in Uptown. The current project will test the feasibility of shared mobility to right size vehicle ownership and drive down carbon emissions. And this is all possible because of the way the zoning was set up for that site. We were pretty fortunate right off the bat that we didn't have to contend with the unknown of could we get this project passed or not. The problem is the ability for small and community focused developers to start a project such as my current one is risky uh, for me if I were to do this again uh, on a different site due to hampering of dense community development in the name of fuck, environmental litigation. If we continue to stop progress behind a false veil of environmentalism, not only will families be impacted by climate change, but the lack of housing poses a major stress on individuals' ability to afford housing. The solution in my recommendation ask is to support Senate File 4183 to allow sustainable developments to occur throughout the city of Minneapolis, St. Paul, as well as surrounding communities. Thank you. Uh, thank you. That concludes um, those who have signed up ahead of time uh, to testify. Um, I'll just ask if anyone else didn't have the opportunity, please step forward now. Okay, seeing no one, um, we will close the public hearing portion um, and uh, go back to a piece that we skipped over. Um, Senator Fate wanted to offer the A1 amendment. Um, so Senator McEwen uh, offers the A1 amendment. Uh, Senator Fate, if you could just describe it briefly. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members. It's just a technical uh, fix to clean up the language. And I think it uh, confines uh, sections one and two uh, to the metropolitan area. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. The amendment carries. Um, so with that, uh, members, questions? Senator Howe and then Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I guess I've only... I think I only have one question, and, and my concern is, is we talk a lot about the, uh, the undeveloped and natural lands. My question is, is I've seen in, in the area that I represent hundreds of acres of trees bulldozed and burned to put in uh, solar panels, and I'm just wondering how does this uh, protect those unprotected lands for something like that happening, or does it? Does this address any of that? So I, I'm glad you asked that because my brother, who lived in for a while in a suburb of Providence, Rhode Island, um, backed up to a beautiful forested area, about five or six acres of forest that got completely clear cut for a solar field. Very, very upsetting. So all you solar developers out there, don't do that. <laughs> all right. Uh, uh, Mr. Wiginius, uh, looks like you want to respond. Uh, this legislation was developed by... Uh, Sierra Club North Star Chapter and other environmental organizations in response to a very specific challenge raised by our, our friends at the American Planning Association. They are aware that environmental organizations such as ours and such as the ones listed on our letter uh, opposed last year's version of this fix, which we viewed as being too broad in its implications for MIRA. And they challenged us to say, um, can you come up with something narrower that meets the goal? The goal being to preserve MIRA and to prevent MIRA from being uh, misused relative to this particular litigation, which is now threatening other cities. Um, the question you raised was not specifically raised in that context uh, because we were attempting to respond to a very specific issue in the metropolitan area relative to comp plans under the jurisdiction of the Met Council. Chair Dibble, if I Please may. Proceed, yes. Um, the question at hand is about a, a specific project, correct? What would happen in the case of the development of solar? Um, and we stand by that our actual ask here is to not consider specific projects. It's that comprehensive plans as a totality are not project specific and that that environmental review should occur at the point of a solar development, for example. So should a solar development be proposed in an area where perhaps it's not suitable um, or would have detrimental environmental effects, that environmental review would still occur at the time of project, like 
application, um, but comprehensive plans are not that specific or granular. They're broad sweeping visions. And so what we're, what, what the challenge is, is that um, Minneapolis's plan, for example, likely doesn't have pinpointed um, locations for solar development in that way, the same with many comp plans across the state of Minnesota. And so at a later time, when something like that would come before a city across the state, there would be both an environmental review process and a local review process. Follow-up, Senator Howell. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I guess, you know, and I've worked in city government a, a long time and, and been involved in comp plans before, and normally we identify an area that is natural and we protect that area natural. So my question, I guess, goes back to, I don't, I don't care if it's a wind farm or solar farm or any development, does, does this current plan protect any of those natural areas uh, from developments like that? I guess that's the question without having, and I, I don't have much background in Minneapolis or St. Paul or any of you know, the metro area as much as uh, I do in my own area, which has no protections for stuff like that. Thank you. Senator Coleman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to start by thanking Ms. Armstrong for a legal perspective I had not thought of before this, so thank you for bringing that up. I also want to offer a perspective I didn't hear in those testifying against the bill today and kind of straighten out some of the narratives. Um, one of the cities I represent, Chaska, for example, was brought up. And yes, Chaska does want to revitalize their downtown. I carried the bill for that funding. But they're throwing in dense housing because they have to, not because they want to. I would recommend going to a city council hearing sometime when they want to add a high-rise apartment to a historic small downtown. And the council members feel they have no choice because of the Met Council to do anything about it. I come from a city council background, and wanting to protect local cities from plans they were forced to adopt seems like a Band-Aid on a bigger issue. We want to do different th things with our cities. I was in Chanhassen. We want to get creative with our solutions, but the Met Council, particularly their density requirements, leaves us feeling completely helpless. At a certain point, I was looking at my election certificate, confused about what it meant when the Met Council had more control over the city I represented than the entire council I was a part of. We were even threatened recently with refusing future utility hookups, wanting to preserve land instead of putting in high density housing if their density requirements on us were not met. So if this bill, it worries me because it comes across to me as something that could snowball into another tool for the Met Council to destroy local control, to destroy city autonomy, and to push density requirements that the citizens of these cities do not want. And it is my sincere hope, members, that we have a deeper discussion about what brought us to this point in the first place. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're getting me. <laughs> Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I guess before the testimony today, I really didn't have a one way or another on the bill, but by some of the testifiers, I, I almost felt offended by living in rural Minnesota. Seriously. Folks, you got to remember where your food comes from, where your manufacturing facilities come from, uh, where your solar fields are, where your wind farms are, uh, building HVAC equipment, building glass for the, the buildings in Minneapolis, and we need workforce out there. And I really felt shunned about living in, Min in rural Minnesota because I'm doing something negative. That's really what it felt like. Um, I, I think that's kind of frustrating. And you know, when we do a, a project in, in rural Minnesota, and I was on city council, I was the mayor, involved in lots of those things, involved in the county, <clears throat> we had to either do an environmental impact statement or environmental assessment worksheet to look at how it impacts what we're doing out there. We go through the regulations to, to decide if it's right or if it's wrong and how it impacts our environment. And there's a lot of, lot of things you have to go through to get something approved to do that because all those things are taken into consideration. But really remember, we need to remember where the farmers are producing the food that, that feed the metro area. And we have to go through regulations out there and to not have to go through regulations in Minneapolis uh, because they want higher density uh, places is interesting. So 
Uh, I'm going to vote uh, against this. Uh, I, I came into committee not having a, a one way or another feeling, but after listening to the testimony, I really have to vote against it. And I'm going to ask for a roll call, uh, Mr. Chair. I, I think this is something that, that is surprising lots of us here behind this uh, table. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Senator Drzinski. I'm sorry I didn't uh, give you, Senator Fate, the opportunity to respond to the previous two comments. I don't know we can move on unless you wanted to respond. Uh, yeah, I'll respond first to the second piece, um, and then I'll pass it to uh, Mr. Virginius um, if I get anything wrong. But this this bill is also intended to protect farmlands. I mean, um, farmlands from um, being converted. It is trying to prevent metro areas from growing and expanding into those areas too. But um, I'll let Mr. Virginius speak to it as well. I, I would just concur with the senator's comments. Uh, I'm old enough to have taken trips to and from Northfield and Faribault and St. Cloud and my parents' farm. And it takes much longer than it used to to get to rural areas because the metro area has expanded so much. Um, the support of organizations like Minnesota Environmental Partnership Land Stewardship Project is in large measure motivated by the desire to protect uh, both undeveloped and agricultural lands uh, from what has been uh, making them disappear in the Twin Cities metropolitan area. I won't speak to the comments of other testifiers, but that was preserving uh, uh, natural lands and agricultural lands was a, a motivation behind the, uh, the organizations that signed the letter in support of this legislation. Great. Thank you. Further questions, members? Senator McCune. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you for bringing this bill in for the good discussion. Um, I'm just wondering if um, either the bill's author or one of the testifiers could tell us a little bit more. You touched on this briefly, but I understand that there was a bill last year, and now this is a different bill, and some changes have been made to it to accommodate, and you spoke to it a little bit, but I wonder if you can talk about what went into those changes and a little bit more specificity about what those changes are. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Senator McEwen. I appreciate Mr. it. And, Mr. Chair, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, there are two fundamental differences between this year's bill and last year's bill. Last year's bill we did not support. Last year's, and, and in that I'm speaking for, for the environmental organizations. Uh, last year's bill ex exempted comp plans from MIRA in their entirety. This language, proposed language, developed by environmental organizations is significantly more narrow than what was proposed last year. It only says that residential density, as approved by the Met Council or determined by a municipality to result in environment and public health benefits, is exempt from MIRA, significantly more narrow. This, in combination with the findings, which is the second difference from last year's bill, um, we believe achieves the objective while doing minimal, uh, while having minimal effect on MIRA and its ability to protect us. Uh, I would just notice, note that this version, this narrower version, is the only version that the, uh, that the organizations on this letter support. Um, uh, we developed it because uh, we were challenged by uh, allies to come up with a version we could support. Um, we are, and just as an example, we're very appreciative of Rep uh, Senator Dreheim's uh, Legalize Affordable Housing Act. Uh, we support many of the components of that, but even that includes last year's version of the fix, and we look forward to working with him and others to make sure that whatever fix is, uh, comes out of this is one that we can broadly support. Thank you. Uh, members, anything further? All right. So uh, we have a member missing who wants to, and we, we have a roll call that's been requested, so we need to get that person back here, and I think they're in the middle of presenting a bill. Is that correct? All right, so, all right, uh, we'll just uh, check on their status. So this happens at this time of year, everyone. We're kind of crashing in on hearing deadlines and everyone's uh, getting their bill hearings and we're just running from hearing room to hearing room. So, do you have any jokes, Senator Fate, you want to tell? <laughs> A song? <laughs>
All right. Senator McEwen has a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that Senate File 4183, as amended, be recommended to pass and be re referred to the Committee on Environment, Climate, and Legacy. Correct. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. All right. And a roll call has been requested. Uh, the clerk will take the roll. Chair Dibble? Yes. Vice Chair Morrison? Senator Jasinski? No. Senator Bolden? Aye. Senator Carlson? Aye. Senator Coleman? Nay. Senator Herr? Yes. Yes. Senator Howe? Nay. Senator Lang? Senator McEwen? Aye. Vice Chair Morrison? Senator Lang? No. Is that, oh, that was did you catch it? No. All right. So let's see, with uh, five yeses and four noes, uh, the motion prevails. Uh, and Senator Pate, you're on your way to environment. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, so do you want to just go ahead? Oh. Your, your bill, yeah. Um, yeah. We're going we're gonna to jump to Senator Jasinski's uh, bill so that he can uh, send his folks along. We'll try to make it blessedly quick. And then my bill is just a small bill. It won't take long either. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I knew the big crowd was about uh, my bill this morning, or this afternoon, about the, I call it the Jetson bill, uh, Senate file 3975. Uh, Believe it or not, with technology the way things are going, we're actually looking at possibly having flying cars come as soon as 2025. Uh, so what this bill does is uh, sets up some uh, standards. Uh, basically, uh, sim most simply understood is when the plane flies, it follows the FAA regulations, and when it uh, drives as a car, it would drive uh, follow MnDOT's policies as well. Uh, with the, we do have one amendment, uh, thanks to Senator Lang, uh, and that has to do with uh, allowing planes to land on certain places, which he, did, which I didn't know existed. Uh, but so Senator Lang uh, uh, gave some input that would actually allow planes to allow to them to land on certain roads with uh, the designation, or as long as it has local road approval. So, with that, I'd offer the A1 amendment. I think that's the A2 amendments. Oh, I'm sorry, it's A2. I had A1 here. All right. You have an A1? Is that the... I'll have Mr. Greenfield. I think it's the A1. That's what's on mine, but maybe that got renumbered. Mr. Chair Mr. and Senator Jasinski, the A2 amendment should be placed. Uh, it's later in timestamp, so the A2 amendment is okay. February 27th. Thank you. Mr. Greenfield, yep. I would offer the A2 amendment. All right. Very good. Uh, this is um, Committee of Original Jurisdiction, and this is an author's amendment. Um, any questions of the amendment, though? All right. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. All right. And thank you, Mr. I explained uh, basically what it does, but I'm going to turn it over to some testifiers uh, from Samson uh, Sky Legal Team that will talk about it. Uh, we also have another uh, vendor as well that will testify on the bill and maybe add some interesting points on what we can see here uh, coming uh, hopefully very soon. All right. So uh, we have online or on Zoom some testifiers. Uh, Mr. Boosfield will start off. Uh, oh, Russell Boosfield, and then we'll go to Sam Boosfield. All right. Uh, and then Andy Wall. So Mr. Russell Boosfield, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me fine? We can hear you, yes. Please introduce Great. yourself and then proceed. Fantastic. 
My name is Russell Bosfield, and I do legal analysis and legal research for Samson Sky. I've been proposing legislation across the country regarding these vehicles which have dual classifications of being a ground vehicle and being an aircraft to basically streamline the, or the, streamline the registration processes and the licensing processes to make it easier for the state to process and kick out registration to keep track of these vehicles as well as to not do double work on any state entity or any uh, owner or registrant. Um, I believe I sent a PowerPoint or a PDF in. Is there anyone there who has seen it or is it available to slide through? It is in our packets, uh, hard copy. So members, you can refer to that. Hard copy, fantastic. All right, so I'd like to kind of just breeze through this a little bit here. Um, you know, slide one is just Samson, our, our logo here. Slide two, flying cars are actually here for real this time. All right. Slide three. This is a picture of Samson Sky's vehicle that we're bringing out. Uh, this is our prototype. We call it the switchblade. It has a fan in the back. You can fit two people in there. Steering wheel controls right now. The wings fold in uh, to the nose from the bottom and the tail tucks back for road travel. All right. Next slide down here should be four. This is the PAL V's aircraft, the PAL V. It has a rotor type um, method of lift and a push in the back for propulsion. It folds down and back for road travel. So these things, these rotable aircraft, have a method for flight and then they have some conversion uh, process they go into to make them road worthy. Uh, Andy here is from Pal V, and he can speak and correct me on anything else I have. He is their, I believe, their sales director, and I'm very happy to have him here today with us. All right, um, fifth slide down. Next slide there is just a picture of our switchblade uh, lifting off the runway during flight testing. All right, uh, sixth slide here. When we talk about rotable aircraft, and specifically this piece of legislation that's been proposed, um, regarding uh, what's, what's in front of the committee here is we're talking about a motorcycle classification on the ground and an aircraft classification in the sky. And in your state, you actually had an auto cycle classification already, which is essentially an enclosed motorcycle and you do away with some helmets and it provides some crash protection, which is fantastic. Uh, federally, of course, this is just motorcycle because the federal government doesn't have any auto cycle classifications right now. And then, of course, when we come down to aircraft classifications through the FAA, um, ours will be experimental, I believe, and Andy Wall can correct me um, in a minute here, that uh, their PAL-V aircraft, when it's starting to get sold in America, will be, registered, uh, will be classified as a light sport aircraft. All right. Um, so next slide here, when we're looking at... The, the, the operational definition of, you know, what the vehicle is at its core, just from a federal standpoint, right? Two or three wheels, uh, the manufacturers for these uh, vehicles for California, or for, not California, for the United States of America will be able to self-certify equipment standards. There's a huge list of equipment standards and the manufacturers go through. It's the same for motorcycles. It's the same for auto cycles. Uh, these vehicles, this legislation is covering vehicles that are designed to fit within pre-existing uh, federal classifications, the classification of motorcycle, their equipment and uh, inspection, their safety inspection, their, sorry here, their uh, standards uh, for safety and uh, equipment. All right, they will be, or at least ours is, um, I'm gonna speak mostly for mine. I don't have PAL-V's uh, statistics on performance 100%. So generally in this, I'll be speaking on behalf of what I know for our vehicle, the Switchblade, Samson Sky's vehicle. Um, you know, it is highway street legal. It can fit in parking spaces. It can fit in your garage. It's designed to operate in and around, you know, everything else, what a, what a motor vehicle can operate in and around with. Um, they'll be, you know, fully enclosed, as you see in our picture, and I think Pal V's picture as well. You know, they have a roll cage equivalent, so if you do end up in an accident in the road, you do have safety protection. They will have safety belts. Um, and again, the regulations are about the same. That's the end of slide seven. 
On slide eight, you can kind of see a picture of our vehicle with its wings folded down with the tail tucked in behind it. Um, three wheels again. All right. Um, slide nine kind of goes over our uh, classification requirements for aircraft just from the federal, federal government. Um, these aircraft, so, so the legislation in front of you here covers mostly what the registration and licensing process as far as operation in and around the ground and of course expanding upon uh, operation as far as aircraft and it also removed a couple um, hindrances from operation because of the vehicle now two classifications it's both an aircraft and it's both a ground vehicle so as you can see with our switchblade it's a fixed wing aircraft and then you see pal v's aircraft it's a rotor type aircraft right so there's different methods of aircraft or there's different types classifications of aircraft that can fit under this still when we're considering uh, having the final driving form uh, fit under the rules for motorcycles basically right three wheels meet all those equipment standards meet all those safety standards so as far as our classifications go we'll probably be experimental aircraft uh, classified and PAL V would probably be light sport aircraft, um, I think is what they're applying for. They are applied, they are approved for in Europe for a similar thing. They are flying and they are driving. So if you have any questions here at the end for Andy Wall, hopefully he'll have some fun stories to tell uh, about that. Um, so federally, you, you have your registration processes. There's no difference when we're talking about rotifold aircraft for anything federal. That's where we're meeting those standards, we're meeting those requirements. All right, um, slide 10 is just a picture of us rolling out of a testing hangar. All right, uh, slide 11 here. I want to cover some things which are similar but are not included in what we have uh, in our draft wording, and that's fine. Think, so these things are not rotable aircraft. Rotable aircraft is motorcycle plus aircraft. Uh, these pictures here and a couple other things you see that fly uh, are not would not be considered rotable aircraft. So flying car, you hear that a lot. It's really a marketing term. Um, our vehicles have three wheels. As soon as you go to four, you're now under the you know regulations and requirements for a passenger vehicle, uh, which have different weight requirements and different equipment requirements, right? So part of the reason why what you have in front of you is this way uh, is to basically make sure that standards are for safety and standards for performance are met as well as we can achieve flight, right? That's another big thing. We have to be light enough to fly. So these vehicles here, we, uh, one of them I think is kind of like a sit down uh, quadcopter, except it's not a control. You sit down in it like a little scooting uh, a hover bike, basically. It's kind of cool. And I think we have the Joby vehicle in here. Under the FAA, these are uh, different vehicles right now. The FAA is looking at these vehicles. They're not aircraft, well, I mean they are aircraft, but they have certain operating parameters that they can perform in and they basically are going to be taking off vertically from one pad and then transferring to another pad vertically. The FAA has a huge study going on right now about these vehicles. It's going to be completed around 2028 um, and on the ground some of these will be considered you know low speed vehicles uh, through the federal DOT and HTSA. Um, so these things, they might fly and they might, you know, be okay going on uh, neighborhood uh, streets at low speeds. Um, vehicles like this would not be considered rotable aircraft when we're looking at meeting the federal regulations and the federal codes for motorcycle and aircraft. All right, we come down to slide 12. That's that point there. There's our CEO looking super happy uh, next to our red aircraft there. All right, so let's talk about um, some of the performance aspects of this vehicle here on slide 13. So uh, Mr. Uh, Boosfield, if you could uh, speed it up, we've got uh, another bill uh, that's gonna take us over an hour. So gotcha. fast forward a little bit, that would be great, thanks. Appreciate it, Mr. Chair. All right, so we'll just go to the very, very end of this. This. Uh, the bill in front of the committee here is basically streamlining these processes to make it easier to own, operate, 
and go through the registration process, which I am super in support of. Um, and I'd like to, you know, thank the committee and thank the lawyers and the legal team who have worked on that. Um, you know, the, the travel, the, the spirit of America and traveling the freedom and independence to move yourself from one location to another um, is, is huge. You know, I've talked to a lot of our pre-flight, pre uh, what are they called? Registration, registration holders on the phone and they can't wait to get these vehicles and use them. Uh, okay, well, I think that about sends, uh, sums up my testimony on that one there. I'd like to pass it off next to uh, Sam Bosefield, if you'd have anything to say, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Bosefield. Uh, Ms. The other Mr. Bosefield, I'm guessing you're related. Um, uh, if you have something new or different to add, um, please testify. Um, if you don't, please feel free to pass. Mr. Bosefield. I think so. Yes. Mr. Chair, this is uh, uh, Sam Bosefield, CEO of Samson Sky, and I, I definitely appreciate the committee uh, looking into the future. And that's what I would say is welcome to the future. This is what we have in front of us and uh, gives us an exciting new look on transportation, the ways to connect people uh, over greater distances, up to 500 miles on uh, unleaded fuel instead of leaded aviation fuel and in your own schedule, rather than having to deal with schedules of transportation um, systems, which, which may be lesser uh, quality for the individual trying to use them. And that's about it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And, uh, and I'll call on Andy Wall, also remote. Uh, and same, same uh, request, Mr. Wall, if you have something new uh, to add to the presentation, please do so. Um, but if you don't, just Say hello and feel free to pass. Thanks. Yeah, well, please introduce uh, yourself and then like proceed. To, uh, my name is Andy Wall, and I am representing Pal V, uh, sales director uh, for the UK and the USA. Uh, thank you so much to you, Mr. Chair, and the committee members for allowing us to uh, comment on this. I think uh, Russ has. Uh, put this case forward and represented the, the cause of the flying car perfectly well. I appreciate uh, our collaboration with them and I would applaud also the way in which this bill has been presented. It's, it's really quite uh, an eye-opener for us coming from the, the European Union and from the UK and you're really setting the bar at a great level for us to, to show as a representative of how to put the flying car on the road. And uh, I don't wish to uh, go over the old ground, but the, the, the PAL B is uh, certainly um, in a similar vein, but different to the Samson Sky vehicle. Um, again, all the same plot. It's great to see you guys uh, really coming together and putting this uh, bill forward for us. And um, I'm fully supportive and I appreciate everything that's going, going on over there. And uh, yeah, look forward to seeing the vote going forward and uh, see how we get on with it. Very good. So, uh, Senator Jasinski, um, I'll lead off. Uh, we weren't sure to call this the, the Jetson Bill or the Chitty Chitty Bang Bang Bill. <laughs> <laughs> Found this book as I was perusing the, the shelves. I thought, I know who needs this book. Senator Jasinski <laughs> needs this book. So, so we'll, call it, uh, we'll call it either the Jetson or the Chitty Chitty Bang Bang Bill. The Jasinski Chitty Chitty Bang Bang go. Bill. So. Touche, Mr. Chair. Um, so with that, uh, members, questions? All right. Well, first I should ask, does anyone else want to testify on this bill? All right. Uh, questions, members? All right. Oh, Senator Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm, I'm sorry I may not have caught all of the uh, de detail, but um, in the, uh, I think it's on slide 12, there's, no, I'm sorry, it's 14. You're talking about the, uh, the altitude. And now, is there a, a limitation that you're looking at right now on the altitude? Like, for instance, uh, uh, there are certain craft that are uh, certified for 500 feet and lower uh, because of um, you know, the need to file a flight, a flight, uh, what is it, a flight schedule. Um, are, are you looking at uh, unlimited amounts of... Uh, of altitude, and also I see that there's uh, pass that you'll have two passengers. 
Uh, are you looking at something that's going to authorize the uh, carrying of a passenger that's not related to the driver that I would assume owns the vehicle? I'm, I'm really, I kind of like this idea, but I'm, I want to be cautious also. Senator Zinsky. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think I have the other. It's, it's treated the same as a, a personal airplane. So when it's in the sky, it has to follow all the FAA rules uh, up there. Uh, when it lands, it has to follow the, the road rules. So really, the the, jink, or the the most of the bill basically is the licensing. So instead of having a license plate, uh, which is not very aerodynamic for it, uh, they go by the tail number. So it's only taxed once versus up in the air and on the road. So I think it has to follow all the personal flight aircraft rules that are applied to the airplanes. And then when it's on the ground, it has to apply that other than having the registration number instead of a license plate. Mm -hmm. All oh, right, uh, Senator, oh, Senator Carlson. Yeah, and I'm, I'm wondering about that, that point of, uh, uh, of altitude that's right between being on the road and being in the air. Uh, for instance, I, I see some of them have, you know, they have the folding wing, wings. Do they fold instantly when they come down on the ground? Can you, can you land on a typical highway that's uh, a 13-foot roadway? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Carlson. Uh, I, I watched the video. It takes about a minute to, to collapse them up into a uh, into a, the car mode and, and their car mode. So they travel within as the car mode. They travel within like they would on a, a road with a Automobile, I'm sorry, but when they land, usually it's at an airport. Uh, and with the exception that we found out from Senator Lang, if it's approved by the local road authority, they can land on a road. Uh, to my understanding, that came from Senator Lang. I did not know that before this came up, but uh, so again, they're, they're mostly will be landing on airports and not on roads, except for certain circumstances. Okay, thank you. And one more question is that Senator Carlson, you need to have a driver's license to drive it on the road, and you need to have a, a, a pilot's license to fly it. Mr. Chair and Senator Present. Carlson, absolutely. Thank you. Senator Howe. All right, very good. Um, anything further, members? All right, and uh, I think you mentioned in your presentation, but remind me if you didn't, you've worked with the, the agencies, DVS and MnDOT, in developing this proposal. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My understanding, yes, Mr. Greenfield and our researchers have worked with MnDOT on this to uh, reach acceptable uh, language. Great, thank you. With that, we will, what is the file number? Got all my papers are spread out. <laughs> What's the file number? So uh, we will lay 30, uh, Senate file 3975 as amended, as amended um, over for possible inclusion in a future omnibus bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I apologize for the, the long testimony. Uh, I didn't realize it was that long myself, so thank well, you. I learned a lot, so it was good. Chair Dibble, whenever you are ready, you may proceed. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members. Um, I know we're going to lose a member here pretty soon. Um, so I do have an amendment to offer. It's not technically an author's amendment, but uh, maybe we'll just offer it at the top um, just to put the bill in the shape in which we're going to discuss it and present it. Um, and then, and then uh, we'll do the presentation if, if that's agreeable to the committee. Uh, very good. So Chair Dibble moves the A-10 amendment. Right, and then Madam Chair, I have an A11, which would uh, amend the A10. Mr. Greenfield, how do we handle that? I never quite recall. Madam Chair and Chair Dibble, we should adopt the A10, and then we should amend the adopted A10. So we should make a motion Great. to adopt the A10, All right. adopt it, and then So, uh, Madam Chair, I'll move the A10 amendment. Uh, so Chair Dibble moves the A10 amendment. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Uh, the A-10 amendment is adopted. Then, Madam Chair, I will we'll move the A-11 amendment to the A-10. And Chair Dable moves the A-11 amendment to the A-10 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? The A-11 amendment to the A-10 amendment is adopted. 
Um, so, uh, Madam Chair, just at the outset, um, I think everyone knows our intention is to lay this bill on the table. Um, and so, in so doing, um, uh, you know, uh, perhaps we can just simply, uh, uh, you know, I wish everyone here was uh, in radical uh, agreement with this idea, but uh, there's a lot of perspectives, um, and so um, uh, a lot of more conversation needs to occur outside of this venue and forum. Um, we started this conversation last year, um, and so um, we're going to continue it outside of this room uh, to see if we can resolve and take in, resolve some of the differences, take in some of the, the great ideas that we're going to hear about um, that have not yet been dreamt up, um, see if we can continue to work on this outside of this setting. So um, that's all a long way away of my saying, um, if everyone can kind of get their issues out on the table and then... Uh, uh, we'll lay the bill on it. As, as it is, we have about an hour's worth of, of just of testimony, um, if everyone kind of confines their testimony to around three minutes. Um, so with that, I will um, do my presentation. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. We just enjoyed a wonderfully warm weekend. The problem with that, of course, is that it is March 4th, uh, when 20 degrees Fahrenheit is normal, along with several inches of snow on the ground. So climate change is not a looming crisis. It is happening. The only option there is, having fumbled our opportunity to get ahead of it, is to keep climate change from becoming as devastating as it might be if left unchecked, stopping as much of the release of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere as quickly as possible. With the adoption of ever more clean and renewable energy, along with conservation and efficiency measures driven by our renewable energy standard and our eco-legislation, we are making progress in reducing greenhouse gases in the electricity sector. However, that is not the case for transportation and agriculture. When we passed our first efforts to put Minnesota on the path of addressing our climate challenges, an analysis of each sector was commissioned. Those analyses included suggestions for what might be done to reduce greenhouse gases for each. The Center for Transportation Studies at the University of Minnesota was tasked with this job for transportation. Their report showed that we could go further and faster than we realized. The rec recommendations were threefold, changes to land use, greater use of more modes of transportation, and changing transportation energy to electric. The first two, of course, are a way to reduce per capita ve vehicle miles traveled by putting places where people need to go closer together, we just heard a big discussion about that, uh, and making transit, biking, and walking more accessible and viable. The third is about making sure that the energy used for transportation is clean. This bill would powerfully accelerate our progress towards that goal. As a reminder, the transportation bill we passed last year, with its historic investments in transit, bike and pedestrian infrastructure, and tying our transportation decisions to vehicle miles traveled, reduction goals was an extremely strong step in that direction. We also funded electric vehicles and infrastructure in this and the energy bills. But much more needs to be done, and there is no time to waste. This bill is complementary and works in tandem with those important steps and measures that we took last year. The goals of this bill, this legislative proposal, are to eliminate greenhouse, eliminate greenhouse gases from the transportation sector as quickly as possible by electrifying transportation, focus electrification and associated health benefits from reduced transportation emissions in communities where both are needed the most, Ensure that any biofuels that are needed in the transition to electrification are grown and produced as environmentally beneficially as possible. It accomplishes those goals by creating requirements and goals to reduce greenhouse gases from transportation by at least 25% below 2018 levels by the end of 2030 to at least 75% below those 2018 levels by the end of 2040 with the goal of eliminating them entirely by 2050. Um, and if you read the bill or tracking, I'll try to make some references to where you find some of these items in the bill. You can find that uh, on line 3.13. It creates a system of credits to incentivize the production and sale of transportation fuel that is less carbon and greenhouse gas intensive. Uh, and if you look at 5.31, the carbon intensity of all of the carbon and greenhouse gases that are emitted in the production and use of a given transportation fuel source is determined. Some fuel sources will have no or almost no net contribution to greenhouse gases. These will have an extremely low carbon intensity. 
For example, an electric, fuel, an electric bus fueled by electricity generated from a renewable source. Others will have a lot, of course, so that will be quite high. In a given year, as measured against how much overall reduction in emissions would be required to meet the goal, the producer of a fuel source that is moving us closer to that goal will receive a credit, a monetary amount. The producer of a fuel source that is moving us away from our goal because the, the amount of greenhouse gases it takes to produce or how much occurs from propelling a vehicle will either need to bring its carbon intensity down uh, by improving its, the fuel itself or the production of the fuel or pay into a credit pool or purchase credits from the pool. The effect of this is to create a market where there are advantages to producing and selling transportation energy that has no or very low greenhouse gases. Of course, electricity from renewable source resources in Minnesota emits virtually no greenhouse gases and would be the most incentivized. As the goal to reduce greenhouse gases becomes greater over time, fuel sources and their producers will have to show that the carbon intensity is improving, becoming less or contribute to the economic incentives for those fuels that do have lower carbon intensities. The bill creates resources to support the purchase of electric vehicles and charging infrastructure. You can look at uh, 9.12 in the bill for this. Utilities will receive the value of credits directly attributable to residential electric vehicle charging. These resources will be directed for the purpose of helping families access electric vehicles and put in charging infrastructure. Fully 60% of these resources would be directed for deployment in underserved and rural communities. Keep in mind that last year, across all of the bills that we passed, in a time of record surplus, we devoted less tax money and, uh, and, and resources through utility programs than is potentially available to carry out this aspect of the initiative, anywhere from uh, just north of $100 million to upwards of of $300 million per year for this purpose. Very powerful incentive. Ensure that the fuel, the bill would ensure that the fuel will continue to be used as we transition to electrification of transportation is as environmentally beneficial as possible. Keeping in mind, of course, the point there is that everyone, a lot of people are, are, are buying cars today as we speak. A lot of those are uh, traditional petroleum-based autos, and those are going to be on the road for the foreseeable future, 15, 20 years. Additional credits will be made available to those biofuels that are grown with environmentally sustainable practices that benefit the soil and water with fewer chemical inputs, better soil management, cover crops, and by using emerging crops that have multiple environmental benefits, including carbon sequestration, soil conservation, uh, water quality benefits, and need far fewer chemicals. And you can look on pages... Uh, eight, uh, lines one, four, 13, and 18, to look at the description of that in our bill. This proposal would allow Minnesota go, to go farther and faster in bringing about clean transportation in a way that grows our economy. For those who worry about the environmental profile of ethanol, this bill would accelerate the reduction in use of ethanol, because ethanol, of course, is tied to the use of gasoline, which will clearly go down faster under this policy. When gasoline sales fall, so will ethanol sales further, the incentives in the bill will spur efforts to reduce the carbon intensity in the production of ethanol and gasoline that is still used in the meantime. There are protections in the bill to guard against a few things. The conversion of land that is currently not in agricultural production um, that may be incentivized to be converted for this purpose or establishing, and you can look at line uh, 7.26, uh, establishing new or ever larger animal feeding operations for methane production that would otherwise not occur but for these incentives, line 7.28, uh, or making the use of carbon that is sequestered for uh, what's called enhanced oil recovery or um, fracking on the Bakken oil fields, line 7.24. That's also, um, we bolster that language uh, with the A11 amendment. Some will claim that this will drive up the price of gas. That is actually not shown to be the experience of other states. Nevertheless, as we, just as we did at the outset of the renewable energy standard policy debates, as well as when we established minimum goals for energy conservation and efficiency, we've created off ramps and soft landings if it's shown that the costs exceed the benefits. Line 5.25. 
Likewise, the carbon elimination called for in this bill is a goal. I acknowledge that the current modeling says we can't quite get to zero by 2050 with current technologies. But we remember that the economic incentives that were unleashed in our renewable energy and efficiency policies were powerful enough to spark innovations that allowed us to go farther and faster than had been imagined. But consistent with today's best science, this is where we need to be by 2050. This also aligns with the current goal in state law to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions across our entire economy by 2050. That is the adopted policy of the state of Minnesota. And we will have many decades of innovation and new options that will be put in place before then. And that wraps up my presentation. Uh, with that, uh, we have Jeremy Martin from the Union of Concerned Scientists uh, to present. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'll just uh, interject before we start with testimony. We have a long list of testifiers, um, but uh, uh, please uh, go ahead and begin, and I'll give some further instructions to the other testifiers when we get to that point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I, uh, can you connect the slide? Thank you very much. One moment while we adjust technology here. Brief pause while we navigate technology. Thanks for everybody's patience. Did you get it? No. It says it's sent. Showing up. Should I uh, just speak on slides? I want just go ahead. And it'll probably show up in a minute. <laughs> it says it's been sent. So I don't know what the email looks like. I don't have it. Um, just send one more time. I think it just came in back. Oh, okay. back. Just okay. came in.
All right, please proceed. So I'm Jeremy Martin from the Union of Concerned Scientists, and I'll speak briefly about the Clean Transportation Standard. Uh, and can you make that full screen? Uh, so the Clean Transportation Standard is a comprehensive and flexible policy to accelerate electrification and clean up liquid fuels. Next slide. Uh, so this is a sort of summary slide from uh, a, a report that my organization put out last year looking at the whole economy uh, and, you know, what it takes to stabilize the climate to get to net zero in the United States. Uh, what you can see here is that orange wedge for transportation is, is one of the biggest ones. Uh, so a, a lot to do in the transportation sector. Uh, next slide. Uh, the, the main strategy to reduce emissions from transportation, which are overwhelmingly petroleum is to replace petroleum with renewable electricity uh, and obviously that means replacing the, uh, the vehicles with electric vehicles. That will take some time, but if we move quickly, uh, we can cut liquid fuel use uh, in uh, cars, trucks, and planes by 85% by 2050. Uh, that still leaves us uh, about 15% 15, 15 of current fuel use for uh, you know, that we'll need to clean up in terms of liquid fuels. And it also will sort of flip. You see, we currently use primarily gasoline and then less diesel and, and then the smallest amount for jet fuel. That ratio is likely to flip over time. Next slide. Uh, so how does a clean transportation standard support those goals? Let's go ahead to the next slide. So, uh, so a clean transportation standard evaluates all the different fuels that are used and it does this on a, a full life cycle basis. And, and that's important because, yeah, great. Uh, uh, because we're trying to compare very dissimilar fuels. So if we're comparing you know, uh, fossil fuels like gasoline and diesel to uh, all, a variety of biofuels and electricity, all of these fuels have emissions, but they have them <clears throat> at different, different kinds of emissions at different points in their life cycle. <coughs> and so to compare, on a reasonable basis, we need to look at the full life cycle of the fuels. Uh, the, the fuels are measured against a standard, which gets, uh, is lowered every year. And so fuels which are more polluting than the standard generate deficits. Fuels that are cleaner than the standard generate credits. As was mentioned, uh, if, you're, if you would like to sell a fuel that doesn't meet the standard, that's more polluting than the standard, then you need to have enough credits to offset the deficits to comply with the policy. Uh, so you can accomplish this. If you're selling gasoline and diesel, you could blend uh, ethanol and biodiesel into those fuels. Uh, but you'd want to find the ethanol and biodiesel that have the lowest carbon intensity, because that would uh, help you to comply with the policy most efficiently. Uh, however, not every fuel can be blended with gasoline and diesel. And so for, for electricity in particular, there's the system of tradable credits. And so that's the reason we need a kind of a credit uh, mechanism here is to have a policy which is comprehensive enough to look at this wide variety of different types of transportation fuels that we're using today and will use increasingly in the future. Next slide. This is a quick summary of you know, this related policy that's been in effect in California over the last 10 years. This shows you the quantities of different uh, low carbon fuels used in California since the state enacted that policy back in 2010. What you can see here, first of all, is that there's been a big increase in the use of these alternative fuels. Uh, there's actually been no increase in the use of ethanol over that time frame. Uh, and, and that the reason has already been alluded to, the, the overwhelming factor which dictates how much ethanol is used in California or in the United States or anywhere is how much gasoline is used in, in those states. And so the most effective way to reduce ethanol consumption is also to reduce gasoline consumption. Of course, gasoline is also the primary source of global warming pollution coming from transportation. Uh, next step in this slide. So, but the policy doesn't regulate volumes of fuel. The policy regulates the carbon intensity of fuel. And so on this side, we see the credits. So this is how many metric tons of emissions below the standard were generated by these different fuels in each year. And what you can see here is that some fuels generate a lot more credit uh, than, you'd, than their volume would suggest. In particular, electricity, the yellow bars at the top, uh, are becoming a, a small but meaningful part of California's transportation fuel mix. They're an even bigger piece of the 
uh, emission reductions that California is seeing. Next click. Uh, and so in 2022, for example, California uh, electricity generated 6.5 million metric tons of credits under the low carbon fuel standard. Those credits sold at an average price of $122 a credit, which adds up to $800 million that supported transportation electrification in California in 2022. So this is just to illustrate sort of how this policy functions. Uh, next slide. So to recognizing the long list of folks here, I'll wrap up. Uh, a clean transportation standard is a comprehensive and flexible policy to decarbonize transportation. It's based on a kind of polluter pays model. The, the oil companies are held accountable to contribute directly and financially to transportation decarbonization. It provides revenue for transportation electrification uh, without uh, requiring ongoing appropriations. All fuels are evaluated based on their uh, carbon intensity. This is an important change from existing biofuel policies, which generally are structured to just increase the use of biofuels. This policy is structured to increase the emission reductions from biofuels and from all other fuels, uh, rather than increasing production. And it's also got important safeguards to address and incentives to address key Minnesota priorities. Uh, for example, a prohibition on credits generated from enhanced oil recovery and incentives for fuel that uh, promote clean water and healthy soil. So thanks. All right, uh, please introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Madam Chair and members, thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of the Clean Transportation Standard Bill as amended. My name is Trevor Russell. I'm the Water Program Director with Friends of the Mississippi River. Uh, you may wonder why a river conservation organization is working on a piece of transportation policy, and the reason is that the CTS reduces our greenhouse gas emissions, reduces our reliance on gasoline, uh, petroleum, and ethanol in our cars and trucks promotes equitable vehicle electrification, and most importantly, creates an exciting new pathway for millions of acres of cropland conservation statewide. While my written testimony that's in your packets uh, covers multiple benefits of the CTS, I'm gonna focus on just three today. And the first is reducing emissions from the big two uh, sources of emissions in Minnesota. We have to reduce green climate emissions from both the transportation and agricultural sectors. Reducing these emissions is essential to avoid the most extreme impacts of climate change with which come with, with undeniable consequences for water quality and aquatic life. And briefly, for example, a 2017 study in Science Magazine anticipated nitrogen loading in the upper Mississippi River Basin will increase by about 24% this century due to climate change. If we want clean water, we need to address our climate emissions and the clean transportation standard does that. The second benefit is directly improving water quality. I believe this bill could do more than uh, to address ag water quality in Minnesota than any piece of legislation in the last 15 years. And that's because this includes a pair of powerful incentives. The first is around regenerative or regen ag. The program pushes biofuel producers to adopt so-called climate smart or regen ag conservation practices on all croplands used for biofuel production. These practices include no-till, cover crops, and optimum nutrient management that can reduce on-farm emissions associated with feedstock production. Better yet, they are proven strategies for improving soil health and reducing farm runoff. Secondly, the legislation also includes specific credit bonuses for certain soil health practices and for the adoption of continuous living cover cropping systems. These CLC cropping systems, including camelina and pennycrass, are under development through the University of Minnesota's Forever Green Initiative, and you'll hear from them shortly. These are among the best tools we have to reduce cropland runoff, enhance farm resilience, and diversify farm income. By creating these powerful incentives for Regen Ag and CLC cropping systems on literally millions of acres of cropland in Minnesota, because we use millions of acres to produce biofuels in Minnesota, the CTS represents a once in a generation opportunity to transform agricultural conservation statewide. And lastly, Senator Dibble noted this, but a quick note on sort of legacy vehicle emissions. It's clear that the, end, the EV transition isn't gonna happen overnight. A CTS is a mechanism for lowering the carbon intensity for legacy vehicles that are not going to be electrified, addressing these emissions from uh, vehicles that are likely to be on the road for decades or more is essential to achieving our climate goals even as we electrify. 
I believe this legislation will do much more than simply reduce transportation emissions. I believe this will do more to protect the Mississippi River and our surface and groundwater quality in Minnesota than any piece of legislation in the last 15 years. I urge you to support Senator Dibble's CTS legislation as amended. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. So, uh, Madam Chair, I'm going to relinquish the table so you can just start running people up. Thanks. Very good. Thank you. Uh, so, members, on that note, we uh, have a long list of testifiers. So, uh, testifiers, I will... Um, as I call you to the table, I'll also name the next person, so feel free to come up uh, as I call your name. We are going to allot three minutes per testifier because we want to hear from as many people as possible. So you will hear uh, a sound when your three minutes is up. At that time, please uh, wrap up your thought. Um, if you keep going, uh, I will eventually cut you off. Um, and members, I will also just uh, make note that there are many letters um, uh, in your packet, so uh, you can note those as well. Um, so we will start with Brendan Jordan, and after that, Margaret Chern Hendrick. Mr. Jordan, uh, as you are ready, please uh, introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. My name is Brendan Jordan. Uh, I serve as Vice President of Transportation and Fuels for the Great Plains Institute and represent the Future Fuels Coalition. The coalition consists of a broad range of entities that support action to reduce transportation greenhouse gas emissions and support development of cleaner fuels and vehicles. This includes renewable fuel producers and marketers, local governments, the airline industry, environmental and clean energy nonprofits, auto manufacturers, EV charging companies, and agriculture and industry groups. The coalition strongly supports moving forward with a Minnesota clean transportation standard. This policy will give Minnesota a major competitive advantage in attracting a range of new clean fuel technologies, ranging from sustainable aviation fuel to electrified vehicle fleets. There are many proposed projects and investments around our state that are more likely to go forward if we pass this policy. As other testifies will note, there, are, there is no other policy proposal under consideration in Minnesota that would have such a large impact on transportation sector greenhouse gas emissions, clean air, clean water, and embracing a clean fuel and vehicle future. It increases choice for consumers, and it creates new economic impact and jobs. Uh, I want to offer a huge thanks to Chair Dibble for incorporating a number of recommendations between last year and this year, and applaud him for his leadership. Uh, coalition members would like to continue the dialogue on a few issues, including eligibility of renewable natural gas, eligibility of carbon capture storage and utilization technology, treatment of biofuels, and treatment of residential EV credits. Uh, we believe the state will be most successful in achieving if it, its goals with a technology-neutral approach. Um, I'll just note that there are similar bills under consideration in Illinois and Michigan. I'd love to see Minnesota be the first Midwestern state to move forward with this policy. Uh, thank you again, uh, Chair Dibble, for your leadership on this issue. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Uh, next, we'll hear from Margaret Chern Hendrick, and after that, Nels Paulson. And for all the testifiers, I won't say it every time, but please be sure to introduce yourself uh, at the beginning of your testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Chair Dibble, committee members. My name is Margaret Cherney Hendrick, and I am testifying today on behalf of Fresh Energy. Fresh Energy is a 30-year-old Minnesota-based nonpartisan nonprofit organization that is working to achieve equitable carbon neutral economies by 2050. We appreciate the opportunity to testify today in support of Senate File 2584 as amended. Fresh Energy has long helped Minnesota adopt forward-looking policies to reduce emissions, such as the 100% clean electricity law that ensures Minnesotans will receive 100% carbon-free electricity to power their lives by 2040. Policies like this have rapidly decreased emissions in the electricity sector, but we cannot slow down. As we've already heard, Minnesota has committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the state by 50% by 2030 and to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. To ensure we meet these ambitious climate goals, we must next adopt bold policy solutions to lower transportation and agriculture emissions. Transportation generates about one quarter of our total greenhouse gas emissions, the largest source in Minnesota. The agriculture sector is close behind, emitting the second highest emissions. Senate File 2584, as amended, will reduce greenhouse gas emissions generated by the transportation fuels while also decreasing petroleum use, removing barriers to the acceleration of equitable vehicle electrification, and re-envisioning outdated biofuels policy. Fresh Energy supports a clean transportation standard because it will create a cleaner Minnesota in four anticipated ways. 
First, petroleum production is expected to sharply decline. Modeling shows that petroleum production could be reduced by 64 to 86% by 2050. A shift away from combusting fossil fuels and vehicles will significantly improve air quality and public health across the state. Second, a Minnesota tra clean transportation standard will result in less ethanol production. Ethanol is sold as a blend with gasoline. Because a clean transportation standard will shrink the gasoline market by accelerating vehicle electrification, it will in turn reduce ethanol consumption. Third, a Minnesota clean transportation standard will remove barriers to accelerating transportation electrification by generating significant credit revenue, between $134 and $268 million annually, with transit buses, delivery service, and school bus electrification being the greatest revenue drivers. Revenue will be invested to fund vital EV infrastructure, including the deployment of statewide charging networks and rebates, with an emphasis on environmental justice and rural communities. Finally, the Minnesota Clean Transportation Standard would be the first in the country to provide incentives for climate smart agriculture practices and regenerative cropping systems, resulting in lower greenhouse gas emissions and improved soil health and water quality. For Minnesota to meet its emissions reduction targets, we must rise to meet the scale of the challenge. The Clean Transportation Standard is essential to equitably decarbonizing the transportation and agriculture sectors. This bill will give consumers, industry leaders, and farmers, and all Minnesotans the process and tools needed to reduce emissions. Fresh Energy Support Senate File 2584 is amended, and we appreciate the opportunity to weigh in on this important issue. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next is Nels Paulson. After that, Colin Kirton. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Nels Paulson, and I'm here on behalf of the Conservation Minnesota members found in all of Minnesota's 87 counties. We are a statewide nonprofit, and we advocate for environmental and conservation issues here at the Capitol. I'm here today express, to express our past and our future support for big ideas that solve big problems. And this bill is a big idea that solves a big problem. To mitigate the worst effects of climate change, we know we need all sectors of our economy to reduce or eliminate climate pollution. Last session, the Minnesota legislature took a huge leap forward and put the electric generation sector on a path to 100% clean energy in the next few decades. We know we need other sectors to set themselves on the same trajectory, and thanks to Senator Dibble's work, this bill would put Minnesota's transportation sector on a similar monumental path. Eventually, most of the transportation sector will likely become electrified because technology and market trends appear heading in that direction. But in the near term, innovative Minnesota-based biofuels will start helping to decarbonize the liquid fuels market as soon as tomorrow. Senator Dibble has developed a remarkable clean transportation standard that will incentivize first-in-the-nation cover crops and other agricultural best management practices that can reduce nitrate pollution and improve water quality. No other state values clean water like Minnesota does, and no other state with a clean transportation standard has crafted their standard to protect and improve water quality like this bill does today. The breadth of a statewide clean transportation standard will not only improve the electrification opportunities and Minnesota-grown liquid fuels, a CTS will even help benefit Minnesota forest industries, allow for new organics waste disposal opportunities, and require resources and investments in environmental justice communities like no bill has ever required. And it will do all this while reducing climate pollution in the transportation sector. We thank Senator Dibble, the Governor's Clean Transportation Standard Workgroup, and the dozens of stakeholder organizations who've been part of supporting this significant bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Paulson. Next, Colin Curitan. After that will be Vince Gunka uh, remotely, and after that, Brian Werner. Madam Chair, Senator Dibble, and members, <clears throat> my name is Colin Curitan, and, and I work as the Director of Commercialization, Adoption, and Scaling for the University of Minnesota Forever Green Initiative. Thank you for hearing my testimony today in regards to the Clean Transportation Standard currently under consideration. My uh, comments today relate to continuous living cover or CLC crops under development by Forever Green, especially winter camelina and domesticated pennycress, and their relationship to the CTS. These two crops are often uh, referred to as winter oil seeds or cash cover crops. To review, our current agricultural system in the upper Midwest is dominated by a few spring annual crops that leave millions of acres uh, of bare soil for much of the year, resulting in soil erosion, nutrient leaching into groundwater and surface water, carbon emissions, and impacts on biodiversity. 
Forever Green is developing over 15 new profitable perennial and winter annual crops that, that can significantly improve the diversity, sustainability, and profitability of Midwestern agriculture. Broadly speaking, CLC crops are tools to advance soil health, climate smart agriculture, and or regenerative agriculture. Winter camelina and pennycress could significantly enhance agriculture in Minnesota by growing a productive third crop uh, from fall through late spring without displacing current crops. The winter oil seeds deliver all the benefits of traditional cover crops, but unlike traditional cover crops, they provide an economic pull because farmers can harvest and market these crops for fuel, feed, food, and industrial uses. Along the way, they can protect water quality, reduce soil erosion, provide significant poll pollinator habitat, and reduce emissions. Forever Green is a global leader in, the developing, uh, in developing the genetics, agronomy, environmental services, uh, environmental sciences, and commercialization of these winter oil seeds. Forever Green has been in robust cross-sector discussion for several years regarding the scaling potential of winter camelina and pennycress as low-carbon fuel feedstocks, including with the world's largest commodity processors, processors and fuel companies. These private sector partners are calling for as much low-carbon vegetable oil as they can get their hands on. They are responding in part to the many commitments airlines like Delta, American, and United have made for, to source large amounts of sustainable aviation fuel, or SAF, in coming years, as well as regulatory shifts to drive the carbon intensity of the fuel sector down, like the Inflation Reduction Act, low carbon fuel standards in three West Coast states, uh, and potentially the current CTS under consideration. Recently, Cargill provided Forever Green with a $2.5 million grant to advance our research on the winter oil seeds, signaling strong industry interest. For reasons I won't belabor, uh, fuels produced from the winter oil seeds result in a significantly lower carbon intensity score than many other agriculturally de derived liquid fuels due to greatly reduced indirect land use change, or ILUC. Their low CI scores make these fuels and feedstocks highly competitive, desirable, and more valuable under a CTS. In other words, the CTS creates significant market demand for these new cash cover crops. In fact, I am confident that a CTS would be the single largest policy lever to advance cover crop adoption in Minnesota's history, making farmers and rural communities significant money along the way. The economic potential of the winter oil seeds should not be understated. 10% adoption on the winter oil seeds in the Midwest would produce a rough raw commodity value of over a billion dollars um, in target cropping systems. Um, Forever Green's goal is not just to develop these crops here, but to drive their industry's development here as well. Uh, in short, um, the CTS policy would be a demand driver for these new uh, sustainable uh, uh, feedstocks. Um, and thank you for your thoughtful consideration of the CTS. It's potential to advance continuous living cover and regenerative agriculture, important uh, co-benefits for water quality and other ecosystem services, and ultimately a more climate resilient future for Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kirtan. Next is Vince Ganaka uh, testifying remotely. After that will be Brian Werner. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Dibble and members of the committee. My name is Vince Ganaka, and I'm the president of United Steelworkers at Local 662 at the Flint Hills Refinery located in Rosemont, Minnesota. I'm here today to speak on behalf of the 600 members that I represent at the refinery in opposition of Senate File 2584, the Clean Transportation Fuel Standard Act. The United States workers have long been leaders within the labor movement to ensure America and the world meet our climate goals while creating and maintaining good family supporting jobs for American workers. This bill in its current form would have a negative impact on our members. Minnesota has two oil refineries. Both employ several hundred people with great paying jobs and benefits. Similar legislation in other states have created reduction in labor at refineries in those states up to a 75% job loss. For instance, in Martinez, California, at a refinery, we represented 400 workers. After the switch to biofuels, we went to 50 workers. Um, in Cheyenne, Wyoming, at a refinery, we represented 150 members. And once again, with the, with the conversion to biofuels, it went down uh, two thirds to 50 workers. Um, FHR is the largest continuous employer of contracted trade labor in the state as well. With the CTS, this would disincentivize the refinery from making capital improvements for a refinery that has become significantly less profitable and will no longer support those trades, creating more job loss within the state. FHR has been an exemplary partner with the state of Minnesota in creating projects to help maintain and protect the Mississippi River and surrounding bluffs and wetlands creating the state's largest solar farm, which supplies the refinery with up to 60% of its daily consumption of electricity. 
This bill has a very real potential to make FHR rethink how much this refinery is valued to them and could put the refinery up for sale to a buyer that is not as willing to use their profits to helping the communities and investing in a strong partnership with the state of Minnesota. Similar legislation um, in the states on the West Coast have seen an increase in gasoline at, and diesel prices skyrocket to 50 cents to a dollar over national averages. That increase will not only directly impact every automobile owner in Minnesota, but the increased expense for transportation of goods will also hit every consumer in this state. Um, at our facility, we produce uh, up to 375,000 barrels per day, um, supply the Midwest with fuels for our vehicles and to heat our homes. Converting to biofuels would reduce that capacity significantly and also remove the ability to provide fuel oil for our homes. We are also the cleanest refinery in the United States, which is uh, very important to our environment. We believe there needs to be a deeper discussion on this bill and a better look at the unintended consequences of it. I ask the committee to please vote no on this bill. Thank you for giving me time to speak on this important legislation, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Kanaka. Next, we'll hear from Brian Werner and then uh, Kent Hartwig, uh, who will testify remotely. Chair Dibble and members of the committee, my name is Brian Werner and I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Biofuels Association, as well as a member of the Clean Transportation Standard Work Group. As discussions on a CTS program ramped up in the last year, a group of Minnesota agriculture and biofuel stakeholders came together to identify a narrow list of consensus principles that we would need to see reflected in a bill to gain our support. I'm here today to testify on behalf of both my association and those stakeholders, which include the Minnesota Corn Growers, Minnesota Soybean Growers, Minnesota Farm Bureau, Minnesota Farmers Union, and the Minnesota Biodiesel Council. First and foremost, we want to thank the chair for his work on policy solutions to reduce transportation greenhouse gas emissions in Minnesota. We share that goal and view a well-crafted CTS program as a major tool to achieve emissions reductions, better air quality, and statewide economic benefits. We also want to recognize and thank the chair for several updates to the bill text including, included in the amendment, like designating MnDOT as the lead state agency for program implementation, providing data protections for on-farm practices, and incorporating unique scoring for soil healthy farming practices. From our perspective, the results of the work group report were clear. We cannot meet the carbon intensity reduction schedule set forth in a CTS without the use of biofuel. That's because Minnesota's farmers and biofuel producers are already producing affordable and accessible lower carbon transportation fuels that are reducing emissions from vehicles on the road today. For a CTS program to be successful, it needs to provide fairness to farmers and biofuel producers by leveling the playing field for all fuels, technologies, and feedstocks that can demonstrate life cycle greenhouse gas emission reductions. We remain concerned about several provisions in the amendment, including the carbon intensity reduction schedule, the ban on biofuels produced from feedstocks grown on croplands with fewer than five consecutive years of cropping history, the ability of the commissioner to outsource fuel pathway approvals to other states, and the open-ended authority given to the commissioner to prohibit credit generation from undefined certain activities. While this amendment falls short of providing a truly level, truly level playing field, we look forward to continuing to work with the chair that, on, to, on improvements that will ensure it adequately addresses the concerns of farmers and renewable fuel producers while also meeting our shared goal of meaningful reductions in transportation and ag emissions. Thank you. Perfect timing. Thank you, Mr. Werner. Next, we'll hear from Kent Hartwig uh, remotely. After that will be Noel uh, Searison. Apologies for saying that wrong, probably. Uh, Mr. Hartwig, please proceed. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Senator Dibble, and members of the committee. I'm Kent Hartwig, Director of State Government Affairs for GIVO. GIVO is a sustainable aviation fuel or SAF company that turns ethanol into a replacement for jet fuel. Mr. Hartwig, we we're having Indian a bit of a hard time hearing you. Could you maybe speak up a little bit or move closer to your microphone? Yep, happy to. GIVO is a sustainable aviation fuel or SAF company that turns ethanol into a replacement for jet fuel. We own an ethanol facility in Laverne, Minnesota and are working to build a 65 million gallon a year ethanol to SAF plant in Lake Preston, South Dakota. 
As a member of the CTS working group, we are a strong supporter of this bill. At its core, the bill will build a market-based solution for carbon reductions in transportation fuels, including aviation, a sector where 73% of aircraft have no meaningful alternative to SAF through 2050. This bill will encourage SAF use in Minnesota and encourage the build-out of SAF production here. Senate File 2854 is also a policy that encourages renewable fuel producers to reduce our carbon score in all ways. And it's why GEVO is planning to use renewable electricity from a 100 megawatt wind farm, green hydrogen, and renewable natural gas to produce our fuels in the lowest carbon intense way possible. SF2584 is unique among low carbon transportation market policies because it will measure the entire life cycle of renewable fuels. Instead of providing a default carbon intensity for feedstocks, it allows for credit premiums when using climate smart agriculture and cover crops. By creating a carbon market that benefits farmers for the carbon sequestration they do on an annual basis, Minnesota will see improved soil health, water quality, and farm income. So this legislation will have an impact on carbon emissions, criterion pollution, and improve impacts from agriculture. So Jeeva hopes you will pass this bill, and thank you for the opportunity to support this legislation. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Hartwig. Next is Noel Sarizian, and uh, after that will be Sarah Wolf. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee for allowing me to speak today. My name is Noelle Sirison. I'm the political manager at MN350 Action. MN350 Action is the climate justice organization that works with frontline communities to ensure their interests are supported while we combat the climate crisis. I'm here to testify in opposition to SF2584, the Clean Transportation Standard. I understand that this bill is brought with the best intentions to aid in the transition away from fossil fuels, and I don't doubt that the individuals that worked on this bill wanted to take significant steps to curb climate change. However, like so many well-intentioned environmental initiatives, this one would put frontline communities and their health at another deficit. Rural communities and farm workers would be disproportionately impacted by the, climate, by the chemical pesticides and fertilizers used in the growth of corn for ethanol production. The biofuels outlined in the CTS would contribute to groundwater, air, and soil contamination that would directly impact these communities. Ag credits in this bill would not be enough to prevent soil contamination and topsoil depletion. These communities will experience health issues due to contamination from these pesticides and fertilizers, such as gastric cancers, among others. Additionally, carbon capture provisions set out in the CTS would allow for carbon capture and storage to support ethanol plants needed for the CTS to work. Not only will this lead to unnecessary environmental impacts from the creation of the needed pipelines to move captured CO2, it would also leave the door open for CO2 to be used for enhanced oil recovery, where carbon dioxide is injected into fracking wells to get more oil out. We don't need to create more infrastructure around oil this far into the climate crisis. While the proposed A11 amendment to the A10 amendment will prevent the use of enhanced oil recovery by explicitly refusing credits for enhanced oil recovery, it does not fully prohibit enhanced oil recovery or the pipelines to support it. Any use of enhanced oil recovery that does not prohibit this outright does not go far enough to prevent the CTS from aiding in the expansion of oil drilling and infrastructure. I would like to thank the committee again for taking the time to listen to my concerns, and I encourage you to vote no. Thank you for your testimony. Next is Sarah Wolf. After that will be uh, Dana Adams testifying remotely. Good afternoon, Chair Dibble and members of the committee. Thank you so much for your time. My name is Sarah Wolf. I'm the Strategic Policy Director at Minnesota Interfaith Par Power and Light, which is a nonprofit that works with faith and spiritual communities and others around the state to enact equitable climate action, which is why we are grateful for work done in this committee and with so many partners in this room. And as we speak today on the clean transportation standard, we appreciate the intent by so many of the bill's proponents to encourage regenerative agriculture practices and to advance electrification as quickly as possible. Upon analysis of this proposal, we see serious risks that the goals of the bill will be hindered by supporting a business plan based on false solutions that extend the life of fossil fuels and has no path to zero emission future. 
I'd like to draw your attention to one of the handouts given to you. Um, it talks about the fossil fuel industry's quiet business model. In pursuit of lowering its carbon intensity, ethanol producers capture their carbon and put it in a pipeline where it goes somewhere else. What they don't often say out loud is that that CO2 pollution is headed for enhanced oil recovery, the process of getting more oil out of low producing wells by injecting CO2 in the well to push out more oil. A 2017 report, also in your handouts, it's rather thick, authored by the Great Plains Institute lays out this business plan, capturing and utilizing CO2 from ethanol. On page five, which is the table of contents, you can see the chapter headings, CO2 to EOR, background and how it works. CO2 to EOR and ethanol, opportunities and challenges explained. Carbon capture and utilization. And on page 25 of this report is the section on state and provincial low carbon fuel standards, which describes how state policies that reduce the carbon intensity of transportation fuels could stimulate private investment in carbon capture and CO2 pipeline development. Now, while these pipelines have been proposed in Minnesota and are moving through the regulatory process, they are not inevitable. And we should be doing all we can to prevent them. Building pipelines is inherently destructive to water and ecosystems. You may recall at least four aquifers were breached during the construction of Line 3. And in addition to that, horizontal drilling caused 28 frack outs in the streams and rivers that they crossed. 63% of the rivers and stream crossed were polluted. Once built, um, and in the construction phase, they require sh large wants, amounts of water to construct the pipeline and to continue operation. And then once built, these CO2 pipelines present continuous hazards from leaks and explosions as long as the pipeline is in operation. The purpose of these Please pipelines... Please conclude, Ms. Wolf. Thank you. I will do that quickly. The purpose of these pipelines, as stated in the draft environmental impact statement, is to allow ethanol producers to lower their carbon intensity scores to take advantage of low carbon fuel standards, such as the clean transportation standard before us today. I'll need to end my testimony here, but while I want, I just want to point out that I appreciate the amendment that was offered on enhanced oil recovery. We do not feel that is sufficient, and we will certainly follow up with these and other points with you. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Wolf. Next, we'll hear from Dana Adams, who is testifying remotely. After that, will be Peter Reginius. Uh, Hi, thank you, uh, Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Dana Adams, and I'm the Legislative Policy Manager for the Coalition for Renewable Natural Gas. RNG Coalition is the largest trade organization for the RNG industry, representing both national and international companies. And I am here today to talk a little bit about how RNG is important for a clean fuel standard to be effective. And uh, first, to state our position, the we would like to support this bill. We are highly supportive of clean fuel standards across the country. However, we cannot support this bill until it's been amended to strike the prohibition on credit generation from new or expanding livestock operations because we believe that it will have unintended consequences, not only for the industry, the RNG industry, but also for the overall climate uh, strategy that Minnesota has. Currently, uh, Farms are the largest methane producers in, uh, in Minnesota, and anaerobic digesters are considered the most effective form of methane uh, mitigation on farms by both the EPA and the Department of Agriculture. And disincentivizing using this technology by removing uh, the credit generation, which was, does provide revenue to defray the costs of what are expensive systems to install, could lead to the unintended consequences of farms going back to less effective means of manure management, thus leading to higher methane uh, emissions, which of course methane is uh, 80 times more potent as a climate warming gas than carbon is over a 100 year cycle. 
And so we would like to see that stricken. We also believe that uh, there is no data to show that allowing credit generation from these farms will lead to uh, farming or herd expansion just for the sake of manure production. The revenue generated from credits and RNG to farmers is not an significant enough to warrant the cost of expanding a herd. Herd, or herd expansion is still driven by the primary revenue for these farms, which is uh, the demand for dairy products. And so there's, and there's data to show under California's LCFS program that there is no correlation between the LCFS program and the, any dairy expansion in that state. Um, we would also like to point Ms. out Adams, that... Ms. Adams, can you conclude your thoughts? Yes. Thank you. Um, I think that's a good place to stop. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next, we'll hear from Peter Wiginius. After that will be Tim Gross. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Peter Wiginius. I was a member of the CTS work group. I'm from Sierra Club, one of 12 organizations which sent you this letter opposing the fuel standard, which will more likely increase emissions than decrease them. Using a market-based tool like this one is 100% dependent on having a CI, carbon intensity score, that reflects reality. If it doesn't, everything built on top of it is wrong. Exhibit B is a Star Tribune article by U of M professor Jason Hill, which describes the CI scores used here as essentially meaningless, quote unquote. He's not alone. He cited a recent committee convened by the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. Their paper is Exhibit C. The consultants hired by MnDOT acknowledged that the GREET model was not designed to be used for this, not a predictive model, not good at estimating land use impacts. But these flaws are not neutral flaws. They mean the GREET model is inherently biased in favor of biofuels. It's not a coincidence that the biggest promoters of ethanol in Congress tried to require that only the GREET model be used to measure carbon intensity. That's exhibit D. Ethanol is not a bridge fuel. It is worse than gas. A recent study from the University of Wisconsin, exhibit E, found that carbon intensity of corn ethanol is no less polluting than, than gasoline and likely at least 24% higher so adding more ethanol to gasoline makes it more polluting. On this essential question of CI scores, the amended language is no different than previous years. We've been told not to worry that the fuel standard won't, in won't increase ethanol consumption in Minnesota. Even if you believe that, it is meaningless. Minnesota exports ethanol. We only have one climate and the climate doesn't care in which state the ethanol is burned in. It's true that oil refiners oppose this bill, but oil drillers in North Dakota support it. They desperately need the CO2 from ethanol to use for enhanced oil recovery, as described by Testifier Wolf and in our minority report, which is Exhibit F. It's no comfort to say the pipeline won't get credits directly for EOR. Their business model benefits from increased ethanol itself. Fighting climate change is more than an engineering problem to be addressed with incomplete carbon accounting. Economic effects ma matter, which are also not included in the GREET model. It matters how long we perpetuate polluting systems. Just because the Walls administration refused to hear from Professor Hill, Dr. Plevin, or any critics of the GREET model, just because they, their agencies insist on downplaying both the climate and water impacts of ethanol does not mean the Senate should follow suit. There is nothing in this bill that would restrain the Walls administration and its allies from using this bill as they intend to for a huge expansion of ethanol and pipelines. Leaving the details to rulemaking means those agencies make the real decisions. The legislature passed historic climate bills in 2023 and we thank you all for that. We need to stay focused on real solutions. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we will hear from Tim Gross. After that, Eric Schneck. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Senator DeBolt, and committee members. My name is Tim Gross, and I am the Executive Director of Fueling Minnesota. Our association represents the 400 licensed fuel marketers who own and operate the majority of the 2,700 convenience stores, 
truck stops, and current refueling sites in Minnesota. We are made up of primarily multi-generational family businesses and farm co-ops found throughout the state. Our association and its members have a proud 100-year history of being the experts in supplying the energy that fuels the transportation sector, including traditional fuels, biofuels, and fast EV charging. We have several major concerns with this legislation, which leads to our opposition of Senate File 2584. I'll just highlight briefly two of those concerns. Our number one concern is, a, is the increased cost to consumers this policy may cause. We have reviewed several reports stating price increases ranging from four cents to over a dollar per gallon for our traditional liquid fuels. California's own recent CARB report states increases from 50 to 65 cents per gallon in the first years and over a dollar in years thereafter. My peer, my peer from the state of, of Washington, which began their version of, the, of their CTS, which started January 1 of 2023, reported after the first marketing of their credits, a 53%, a 50, I'm sorry, 53 cent per gallon price increase to their traditional fuels. All reports aside, looking at the difference today on a real-time online database called Gas Buddies, eight o'clock this morning, the nearest competing retail, retail sites between Washington and Idaho, the state that does not have the CTS policy in place, on Interstate 90, less than five miles apart of these retailers, preferred a gas price increase difference of 71 cents per gallon. Washington prices were higher. So I'm not here to say which report is right or not, but as retailers, we live by the competition factor that we are placed in. Per my Duluth Public School education, using a possible increase of 50 cents per gallon in the amount of traditional fuel, fuels sold today in our state annually, which is 3.5 billion gallons, of just traditional fuels, the increased cost to fuel consumers in Minnesota in their first year could approach $1.75 billion. Besides the effects to consumers, I'd like to also highlight the negative effect for fuel marketers due to these price increases. Border retailers would be at a competitive disadvantage. All right, I'll just go through one then, <laughs> compared to other retailers. So the border retailers will be affected by this. So I, again, thank you for the, your time. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Gross. Next, we will hear from Eric Schenk, and after that, Bentley Graves. Thank you. My name is Eric Skank, Executive Director of the Minnesota Forest Resources Council. The 17 stakeholder members of the, this council are statutorily responsible for providing policy recommendations to the legislature that promote sustainable management, use, and protection of Minnesota's forest resources. My testimony here is supported by a council resolution 2022-1 adopted on January 18th, 2022. A year ago, Washington became the third state in the country to implement a clean transportation fuel standard. Prior to this, Washington made national news by flying an Alaska Airlines commercial jet from Seattle to Washington, DC. What made this flight noteworthy was that it used a biofuel derived from wood. This dramatic achievement demonstrates the potential for Minnesota to also lower its greenhouse gas emissions of the transportation sector by supporting wood-based biofuels. MFRC has two recommendations for this committee to consider. One, include woody biomass as an eligible biofuel feedstock within Minnesota's CTS policy, and two, support through credit generation or other financial means, sustainable force management practices that further lower life cycle greenhouse gas emissions associated with wood-based biofuels. These recommendations are supported by the following three facts. First, low carbon emitting woody biomass for biofuels creates a more rapid pathway to achieving CTS's emission goals. To understand this reduced carbon emission potential, compare wood-based renewable diesel's carbon intensity value of approximately eight with soybean-based biodiesel CI of 58 or petroleum's CI, diesel CI of 90 or more. An advantage of renewable diesel from derived from wood 
is it has all the same qualities as petroleum-based diesel. In other words, it can be a complete replacement. That also means that it can be blended. It could be blended with uh, soybean-based biodiesel or even petroleum-based diesel. Secondly, Minnesota has a sustainable supply of woody biomass that is vast, underutilized, and rapidly increasing on private, public, and even urban forest lands. A CTS can support sustainable forest management by providing a market for important forest measures and actions that will further enhance forest resiliency to climate change. Finally, innovative technologies are rapidly transforming woody biomass into an economically viable feedstock for renewable diesel, sustainable aviation fuel, and other biofuels. A CTS that supports the forestry sector also will spur even more innovation and participation in CTS markets and at the same time promote the environmental, economic, and societal benefits sought by Minnesota's climate action framework. I have one footnote um, to add. The, um, the Minnesota Forest Resources Council is currently working on a, a forest carbon baseline and life cycle assessment. The purpose of this is to understand to how the forestry sector can be even better. Thank you. Think Wood. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next, we'll hear from Bentley Graves. After that, will be Sarah Mordian. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. My name is Bentley Graves with the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Uh, in the last year or so, as uh, discussion began to, uh, to really pick up around the creation of a clean transportation standard in Minnesota, the Chamber developed and adopted policy language to guide our engagement in this discussion and debate. And in short, that policy highlights the importance of understanding the costs and economic impacts of a proposal like this. Uh, as such, uh, we were disappointed when the report from when the work group was released and noted that an analysis of the, analysis of the economic impacts associated with CTS implementation, uh, including its potential impacts on consumers, was outside the scope of the work group. So in the absence of a Minnesota-specific analysis regarding costs or economic impacts, we looked to data from other states to get some sense of the potential costs and, and economic impacts here. Looking at the program in California, uh, recent uh, whose reduction goals line up well with those under the consideration in this bill, a recent analysis by the California Air Resources Board indicates that fuel prices could quickly rise 50 cents per gallon and increase considerably over time from there. This is particularly concerning for Minnesota businesses where the cost of doing business is already high. As an example, we have the country's highest corporate tax rate and the sixth highest personal income tax rate. In contrast, Minnesota has enjoyed a comparative advantage in fuel prices with prices historically lower than the national average. But increasing fuel prices by 50 cents or more would erase this important cost advantage. We're also concerned about the potential economic impacts of a proposal like this. The same recent uh, report from the California Air Resources Board indicates that California's low carbon fuel standard will lead to slower gro economic growth in the state. That would be a particularly troublesome outcome here in Minnesota as a state whose economic growth has consistently lagged the national average in recent years, growing at half the rate of the U.S. economy and ranking 36th for GDP growth and 28th for job growth. The data from California indicates that this could add additional headwinds to our economic growth in our state. These data points related to fuel costs and economic growth can be helpful in understanding the impacts in Minnesota of a clean fuel standard. But it's also true that Minnesota is different in many respects than California. Our fuel market is different, our economy is different, our geography is different. That's why we believe there must be a thorough analysis, discussion, and understanding of the costs and economic impacts of a clean fuel standard in Minnesota. But to date, that doesn't exist. Without it, we're left to ascertain what we can from the experience of others. And while that's an imperfect method, it nevertheless underscores the extent to which a proposal like this could increase costs and hinder economic growth in our state. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we'll hear from Sarah Mordian. After that, Jake Rint. Thank you, Chair Bolden, committee members. My name is Sarah Moradian, and I am the Government Relations and Policy Director for CURE, a rurally-based nonprofit organization dedicated to protecting and restoring restoring resilient communities by harnessing the power of the people who care about them. I appreciate the opportunity to testify in opposition to SF 2584. 
we recognize that the intentions behind this policy are good. Unfortunately, a clean transportation standard is not the way to achieve our goals. The focus of my testimony is on how a CTS would incentivize the construction of carbon dioxide pipelines and why this is detrimental to our rural communities. To maintain compliance with a decreasing carbon intensity score, ethanol producers will need to change the way they do business. Over the last few years, it has become clear that the preferred solution is to maintain the status quo and commodify the pollutants, namely CO2, that threaten the industry's viability in a carbon-constrained world. To do this, ethanol plants need to capture CO2 emitted during fermentation and send it elsewhere. This is problematic for many reasons, but here are just three of the biggest. First, capturing carbon uh, at ethanol refineries does not address the pollution that occurs during the production of ethanol. Rural communities of Minnesota disproportionately suffer the air and water pollution emitted, uh, emitted from the increased use of pesticides and chemical fertilizers associated with ethanol production. Second, once captured, the CO2 must be transported to its destination. The most common method of transportation is via high pressure pipeline. But no pipeline is without risk. They will leak or rupture. It's just a matter of when, where, and in what quantity. I encourage you to research the 2020 rupture of a CO2 pipeline in Satarsha, Mississippi to understand the magnitude of risk we're talking about. Again, given the location of most of Minnesota's ethanol refineries, we will be asking rural communities to take on the risk of hosting these kinds of pipelines. Third, CO2 captured in Minnesota is likely to be used for enhanced oil recovery, which is not the same as fracking, to obtain oil from depleted wells that would have otherwise been unavailable. This has historically been the most common and lucrative use of CO2, and North Dakota has told us that it hopes to continue that trend. Although the amendments seek to assuage some of these concerns by prohibiting the generation of credits from carbon capture and storage, lacking permanence, certification from a recognized saline aquifer, or other permanent sequestration technique, these terms are not clearly defined in the bill. And even with the A11 uh, EOR caveats, the bill still incentivizes CO2 pipelines and may even allow sequestration at Talon's proposed copper nickel mine near Tamarack, Minnesota. The fact remains that despite our best intentions, as soon as CO2 leaves our state borders, there's very little we can do to ensure that the CO2 captured here does not end up being used for the production of fossil fuels. I hope that those with the good intentions of getting this bill passed will listen to the concerns expressed by Cure and others today and consider alternatives that do not maintain the status quo, do not put our rural communities at risk of CO2 pipelines, and do not leave the essential details of this policy up to the rulemaking process where powerful interests can and will seek to weaken the requirements. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Next, Jake Rent. After that, John Haus Hausladen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Dibble, members of the committee, my name is Jake Rent. I'm Vice President of Public Affairs for Flint Hills Resources. Flint Hills operates the Pine Bend Refinery in Rosemont, uh, Minnesota. We provide the majority of the transportation fuels Minnesotans uh, depend on every day. Also, home heating fuels and actually 10% of the nation's asphalt. So a significant uh, contributor to a lot of the products we depend on every day. We're also one of the largest work sites in the state of Minnesota, uh, with over 1,000 full-time workers and uh, thousands of contractors that uh, implement investments that we make uh, every year in our facility, uh, millions of dollars worth. As a result of these investments and other innovations at our facility, uh, Pine Bend is now one of the most energy efficient refineries in the entire country. The site has cut its emissions by 70% since 2000, while increasing production to meet demand in Minnesota. We've also reduced our greenhouse gases on an intensity basis by about 17%. We just recently completed uh, the largest solar installation of its kind in the United States uh, that helps power our facility. Under Senate File 2584, none of these investments would, be receive, would receive any significant uh, credit uh, under this program. Uh, few, if any, of these improvements would be credited, in fact. Unlike when California passed or adopted this policy um, back in 2009, Minnesota already blends ethanol and biofuels at nearly a maximum level. In fact, most uh, Minnesota and California are pretty much at the exact same place right now. After California's program since 2009, Minnesota's pretty much starting where they are. So the point of view going forward, the anticipation as to how much this program is going to cost lines up very well with California's projections, which you've heard others peop other people testify, is looking at about 50 cents per gallon initially, and then upwards of a dollar per gallon going forward and into the future. So it's a significant cost to consumers. 
It's also important to recognize that this policy is not taking place in a vacuum. Uh, Minnesota's cl uh, clean transportation standard would compete directly with California's low carbon fuel standard and Oregon and Washington's programs. These uh, these uh, uh, carbon, uh, lower carbon intensity fuels uh, required to accommodate our mandate, we compete directly for those fuels, they're, and they're in limited quantity. Uh, Minnesota also competes with the federal program, uh, the federal renewable fuels standard. Uh, so these uh, competing policies uh, influence the movement of these fuels in the marketplace. To my knowledge, the working group did not evaluate that and how the movement of these fuels affect both prices and availability of these fuels in the marketplace. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the working group also did not evaluate uh, how these policies will interact with other recent changes in state law that, a fuel, uh, that affect fuel supplies and fuel prices. As you know, last session, uh, the legislature indexed the state's 25 cent per gallon motor fuel tax to inflation. And then beginning this year, uh, the, this is not very well known, but Minnesota and a handful of other states uh, will be uh, developing their own unique gasoline specification. And that too will increase fuel prices for Minnesotans going, going forward. So we do think it's important that these uh, factors are also considered as you evaluate this policy. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next, we'll hear from John Hausladen. After that, Lance Klatt. I have a handout for the page, Madam Chair, please. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, I am John Hausladen, President of the Minnesota Trucking Association and a member of the CTS Work Group. And I'm here today to testify in opposition to Senate File 2584. Trucking starts with yes when it comes to emission reductions. Over the past 20 years, the trucking industry has modified operating practices, streamlined equipment design, and invested heavily in clean burning diesel engine technology. The result, particulate matter, nitrogen oxide, and sulfur emissions down to near zero levels. Now while the goal of a clean transportation standard is laudable, it is unworkable for the trucking industry because it's based on at least four false assumptions. First, while it claims to be neutral, it functionally forces vehicle electrification. The credit and deficit system effectively uses electricity as the baseline and punishes any fuel that does not match it. Second, it does not accurately account for the true carbon intensity required to create electricity. It discounts the significant carbon usage to create and maintain an expanded system of electricity generation and distribution. Third, it makes no distinction between vehicle types and the vastly different ecosystems needed to support vehicle electrification. It creates a one-size-fits-all approach, and charging passenger vehicles in a garage and an over-the-road truck are dramatically different. Yeah, thank you, here's the handout. Diesel fueling takes just 15 minutes allowing a truck to travel roughly 1,200 miles before needing to refuel. Long-haul battery trucks require five to eight hours to charge and can cover only 150 to 330 miles, and that's assuming the charges are available. Repairing those vehicles requires an entirely new support system. Fourth assumption, it fails to quantify the indirect cost to consumers. The California Air Resources Board has calculated the low carbon fuel standard to increase diesel, focusing on diesel, up to 59 cents per gallon in 2030 and up to a staggering $2.35 per gallon in 2050. A new clean diesel long haul tractor today typically costs 180 to 200 and excuse me $200,000. While a comparable battery electric tractor can cost upwards of get this $480,000. More details can be found in the infographic. The reality is that class seven and eight trucks will be powered by internal combustion engines run on diesel or similar fuels for decades to come. Government policies need to acknowledge and address this reality. We believe adopting a clean transportation standard as outlined in this bill will force vehicle electrification, drive up costs for consumers, and cause significant supply chain disruptions. We urge the legislature to take a go slow approach and allow the trucking industry to maintain choice in the fuel that powers our vehicles and Minnesota's economy. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next, Lance Klatt. After that, Kate uh, Klossner. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee, 
My name is Lance Klatt, Executive Director of the Minnesota Service Station Commuter Association, representing over 300 independent fueling and auto repair members in the state of Minnesota. Members of the Minnesota Service Station and Commuter Association have concern relating to Senate File 2584. Being the first fueling retailers of Minnesota adopting E15 and other advanced biofuels, many of these retailers have utilized USDA's HBIP program while successfully applying for state grants and adoption of offering E15 and additional homegrown biofuels, of course, supporting our local farming communities. It's ultimately a concern that looking at Senate File 2584, that all liquid fuels, including homegrown biofuels, are not part of the agenda going forward. And also must state that when all these grant programs, whether it's uh, the, the Volkswagen settlement program and the new EV program, the infrastructure program that President Biden put into play, and all the other HBIP programs and USDA programs, my retailers are thoroughly confused of which infrastructure they should actually put into their ground. So I just want to let that uh, be noted. Many of my small independent re fueling retailers, my organization conduct daily business near bordering states, such as, such as Tim Gross had mentioned earlier, such as Brady Service Center in Moorhead, where fuel prices are already cheaper in North Dakota due to cheaper gas taxes. Adopting a CTS in Minnesota will drastically create a larger price discrepancy disadvantage for a majority of our fueling sites near bordering states and cities. California publicly admits using CARBs, California Resource Board's own LCFS analysis, which is similar to Minnesota's CTS, will result in nearly 50 cents per gallon increase for the years to come, rising to over $2 more per gallon, which you've heard earlier for diesel fuel, and up to $1.50 more for gasoline, while adding more than $800 a year to additional fuel costs to Minnesota consumers. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Klatt. Next is Kate Klossner. After that is Kent Kaiser. There's a lot of names that start with K. <laughs> Begin. Hi, good afternoon or evening. Um, for the record, my name is Kate Klossner and I'm the Government Affairs Manager for Marathon Petroleum here in Minnesota. Please see our written testimony for more about MPC, our 370 Minnesota-based employees, and our investments in the next generation of fuels. Thanks for the opportunity to testify today on Senate File 2584. Marathon Petroleum is committed to reducing emissions and increasing renewable fuels, but it does object to this bill for several reasons. Clean transportation programs raise the price of fuels for consumers, which we've heard today, as evidenced by the state-level fuel program implemented on the U.S. West Coast. Reports stating the contrary ignore that there is real-time publicly available data that supports this fact. Every state that has passed a similar CTS has experienced these fuel price increases. Additionally, Minnesota's targets require a more aggressive decreases in GHG emissions from the baseline than the other states' programs require. And because of this, the Stillwater Associates study estimates that the per gallon costs will be greater than we see in those West Coast states. The program's aggressive GHG reduction schedule does not support the long-term growth of agriculture or biofuels. California had little to no biofuels infrastructure when it started its LCFS program. Here in Minnesota, our farming and biofuels industry's contributions to the GHG reductions across the state are robust. This CTS would ultimately be a complete phase out of the liquid fuels re, uh, market that agriculture has already made huge investments in. MPC shares the author's goal of reducing emissions, but this CTS is not achievable. ICF Consulting, the state's own hired consultant, showed that even using the most optimistic assumptions, the targets for 2030 and 2040 could not be met. And the 2050 target would be difficult with technology that is difficult to conceive of today. ICF also showed that Minnesota will see a decrease in emissions by 30% by 2050 by simply continuing on the path it's already on without a clean transportation standard. California's LCFS program, similar to this CTS, came into effect in 2009 and has only seen a 12.6% reduction in the carbon intensity of transportation fuels by the end of 2022. Unrealistic targets may also impact the fuel supply to the state, leading to potential closures of facilities, which may further exacerbate supply issues and cost increases. This pr proposed 
sorry, this <laughs> proposed clean transportation fuel program will significantly impact the prices to consumer and it will harm Minnesota's economy. It will quickly phase out the robust renewable fuels program that already supports the state. And finally, the GHG targets are unachievable according to the state's own study and should not be the basis of a transportation program that will affect every consumer of the state. Thank you for the consideration of these points. We look forward to working with the legislature on an alternative approach that protects consumers, the farming and industry, and reduces emissions. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next will be Kent Kaiser, and then our last testifier will be Dale Lutz, uh, testifying remotely. Thank you for allowing me to testify in opposition to Senate File 2584. I'm Dr. Kent Kaiser, Secretary Treasurer of the Domestic Policy Caucus. I live here in the North End. At a time when Minnesotans are already struggling with inflation, the last thing the state needs is a costly California-style fuel ban. And to be clear, requiring Minnesota's transportation fuels to achieve a 100% reduction in carbon intensity by 2050 is not a fuel standard, but a fuel ban. At the end of the last session, the legislature created the Clean Transportation Standard Work Group, focusing exclusively on how the state could go about implementing the CTS policy. It has not examined larger, more substantive questions about how much a fuel ban will cost consumers, what impact it will have on Minnesota's existing fuel industry, or if such a policy is even workable in Minnesota at all. The work group's own analysis shows that simply sticking with the current Minnesota policies, which would impose no additional costs on Minnesota families, would achieve a 30% reduction in the state's transportation sector emissions. We would outperform California if we did nothing new. However, if the fuel mandate policy moves forward, Minnesota families could be forced to pay hundreds of dollars more a year in fuel costs in order to subsidize electric vehicles and fuels produced in other states. We know the legislature likes to incentivize citizens with carrots and sticks to achieve policy objectives, but this bill would disproportionately stick it to low and middle income families and rural residents across Minnesota. Not surprisingly, a, res a recent informal poll we conducted shows that 77% of Minnesotans oppose a liquid fuel ban. We urge you, instead of promoting regulations favoring only one technology, please reject this California-style fuel ban and support our state's diverse energy portfolio, including biofuels and clean technologies. Please oppose Senate File 2584. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, two more testifiers, members. Next will be Dale Lutz, who is uh, testifying remotely, and last will be Isaac Orr. <coughs> Mr. Lutz, please proceed. Uh, Madam Chairman, Senator Dibble, and, and uh, committee, uh, I am Dale Lutz. I'm a retired chemist who has been working on re reducing the concentration of carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas in the atmosphere for over 17 years. I attended and provided public comments at the last four meetings of the Clean Transportation Standard Work Group. I pointed out that it is possible to achieve 100% reduction in the carbon intensity of Minnesota transportation sector by electrifying the remaining fuels like, like sustainable aviation fuel, by using renewable energy to recycle carbon dioxide from unavoidable sources like cement production recycling that into synthetic hydrocarbon fuels, sometimes called electrofuels or e-fuels. This process uses existing technologies and large-scale projects are currently underway around the world. One example is the E-Jet sustainable aviation fuel plant under construction by the company 12. Um, there are other examples, Veolia, in, uh, in Europe, MAN Energy in Patagonia, um, several others we can get to. Um, starting construction of the e-fuel infrastructure soon in Minnesota will allow achieving the 75% carbon intensity reduction by 2040 and the 100% carbon intensity reduction by 2050. This includes new dedicated renewable energy to supply the new electrical load on the grid. This could be dedicated off-grid or, but you're gonna to have to add the appropriate amount of renewable energy for this. Um, however, 
the modeling results due to time limits presented at the work group were limited to biofuels and electric vehicles and did not include the electrofuels possibility, even though it currently exists. Uh, this resulted in very conservative estimates, which helped the biofuel industry argue to, for weakening the carbon intensity of reduction targets and included changing the 2050 target to simply a goal. I strongly believe that Bill SF2584 should stick to the carbon intensity reduction targets of 75% in 2040 and 100% by 2050. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Lutz. And our last uh, testifier is Isaac Orr. And members, I would draw your attention uh, to a one-pager um, from this testifier in your packets. There's also a complete report which has been paste, uh, posted online with the committee materials. Uh, Mr. Orr, please proceed. Perfect. Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify. On si or, my name is Isaac Orr, and I'm a policy fellow specializing in energy and environmental policy at Center of the American Experiment. Uh, Senate File 2584 would force Minnesota to adopt a much more extreme and therefore expensive version of California's low carbon fuel standard. Uh, this is the most extreme proposal of this nature in the entire country. If passed, the legislation will harm Minnesota families and businesses by increasing the cost of gasoline and diesel fuel between 39 and 45 cents per gallon by 2030, hurt farmers by effectively regulating biofuels out of existence, limit uh, consumer choice, provide no additional revenue for roads and bridges, and have, a, have zero measurable impact on future global temperatures. The Oregon Department of Environmental Quality freely acknowledges that these regulations increase the price of fuels used for transportation. Uh, they have it on their website. It's called the Cost of the Clean Fuels Program. Our report uh, that you can find in the, the notes here found that rising gasoline prices will harm Minnesota families and businesses everywhere, but rural residents will be disproportionately harmed because they drive further to get to work, the grocery store, and everywhere else they need to go. While Ramsey County households in 2030 would, on average, pay only an additional $343 per year under this proposal, Minnesotans living in Jackson County would pay $1,151 dollars per year. Uh, in the past, this legislation was often framed as a way of helping the farming community by boosting biofuel production, but as other testifiers have mentioned, this regulation would do just the opposite. E10 would generate deficits by 2025, E15 by 2026, and E85 by 2032, and renewable diesel would be a deficit generator by 2036. As a result, this uh, legislation uh, regulates biofuels out of the market and limits consumer choice by punishing anyone that doesn't drive an electric vehicle. Based on stalling EV sales, this is a problem because consumers are not ready to adopt these cars. Uh, the CTS will also provide zero money for roads and bridges, and it will reduce future global temperatures by 0 .0 or 0 0.00095 degrees Celsius by 2100, an amount far too small to accurately measure. Uh, Minnesotans are already struggling with high inflation. Please don't make it worse at the gas station. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Orr, and thank you to all the testifiers for uh, testifying today and for uh, being mindful of the three-minute time frame. Uh, Chair Dibble, as you make your way back to the table, anything you would like to add at this point before we move to member discussion and questions? Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I appreciate uh, all the testifiers uh, uh, who brought uh, um, all their perspectives. Um, as you can see, uh, a lot of folks um, have, you know, very strongly uh, held perspectives um, and, uh, and and points of view on this subject. Um, I, I think it would be important, um, you know, maybe um, yeah, I can kick one of these guys out for a second. Uh, I know that the Department of Transportation, uh, Mr. Sexton, is here um, and could share just a little bit of information. Uh, um, uh, that that would help us understand some of the effects on a couple of matters. One is um, the effect on on uh, the price of gas. Um, you know, I think we heard claims of fifty at fifty cents a dollar in, in other states, um, as well as uh, whether or not um, there's been some discernible improvement in the emissions of greenhouse gases from policies like this in other places. So. <coughs> Very yeah. good. Please uh, introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my, for the record, my name is Tim Sexton. I serve as Assistant Commissioner for Sustainability Planning and Program Management with the Minnesota Department of Transportation. 
I also had the um, the opportunity to coordinate along with three other state agencies, the Clean Transportation Standard Working Group uh, that worked, uh, that met nine times with over 40 people over the last six months or so. Um, so I will do my best to try to reflect what we heard from experts, uh, both in the room mm -hmm. and invited experts that we heard uh, attend the working group. So in terms of emission reductions, um, we, uh, based on modeling done by the state uh, here in Minnesota, along with examples from other states, um, a low carbon fuel standard, as it's called in some places, or a clean transportation standard, as it's referred to here in Minnesota, um, has shown the ability to reduce emissions to varying, various degrees. It can be a little bit hard to differentiate in states like a California because they have so many policies. And I bring that up because that also makes it hard to isolate the any potential impacts to fuel prices because of so many different policies there. Um, but more importantly, because fuel prices are really influenced by the global fuel market is what we heard as part of the working group, much more so than any individual state policy. But in terms of emission reductions, we did hear that the, the original sort of um, goals or targets that were identified would be really challenging to, to achieve. So if you look at the report, um, we did model sort of a moderate scenario that showed um, with today's technology what people felt like was achievable. Um, it's not to say that more uh, reductions are not possible with technologies that are not yet available, um, but that's why if you see in the report there is a moderate um, that slightly reduces the original targets of the clean transportation standard as being um, more achievable. So that looks like closer to a 70% reduction compared to 2018 versus a 100% reduction. The other thing that we heard was that the biggest shift would come um, from the change from diesel to renewable diesel. And that is important because renewable diesel is a drop-in fuel. So that means you don't need to modify your vehicles, you can just use a different fuel to use it. Which transitions me, um, Chair Dibble, to the, the price changes. Um, I mentioned the complexity of isolating an individual policy on fuels that are really impacted by the global fuel market. And that's what we heard from presenters, um, is that it, there's no real academic credible resource that has identified or isolated really the fuel price changes from a place like California that stems directly from this policy because there's so many factors. We did hear from Oregon though, which we found to be maybe the most um, similar state of the three states that have similar policies. So being Washington, Oregon, and California. California is very complex, very different market. Washington, the policy is very new. Oregon's, Oregon's had a policy in place for about six years. They also have significant cost containment measures and they evaluate annually the cost of the policy sort of the best they can on different fuel prices. And that's what we, uh, we heard from Oregon that I just wanted to share briefly. Um, I'm sorry, I'm looking at my notes here, but the prices, there, there was some, they felt like some impact of, of the clean fuels policy uh, based on the credit price of their, uh, their market. And it varied from plus 10 cents per gallon for 10% ethanol or E10 to minus 70 or minus 60% for 100% biodiesel. Maybe more applicable to some of the folks here, um, B20 or 20% biodiesel had almost a 2% reduction per two cents per gallon cost reduction from this policy because of the incentives that are put in place for these lower cost fuels. I think that's the best I have there for you, right. Chair, Appreciate if that's okay. That. That's, uh, yeah, Senator important, important data. And Thank, oh, sorry, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and also, you know, I just wanted to um, uh, respond to a, a couple of points. Um, one is that uh, um, there was a you know, claim made that certain people were, uh, were not sought out for, you know, to provide information. Um, in fact, they were. So there wasn't a, a, a flat out refusal to hear information on the part of the work group. But the point also is that the bill in front of you does not necessarily reflect um, 
the work group. I know it, it, you know some of the some of the work um, that was informed by the work group is reflected in this bill. Um, uh, but it, you know the work group was the work group. The bill is the bill, um, which is the product of 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 my thinking and uh, as well as the proponents. Um, I think it is extremely important uh, to respond to this point um, uh, made by my close friends, uh, people I respect and admire a lot, um, who are fearful about the prospect of the utilization of carbon um, uh, from uh, the, the processing of biofuels for the purpose of uh, enhanced, of putting it into pipelines, which in and of themselves uh, may be fraught and uh, for use of enhanced oil recovery uh, in North Dakota. Um, uh, there's, there's no way to construe within this bill um, that that would credit or incent um, that sort of behavior, and uh, I would never support. And of course, the argument is that's not enough. Um, you know, if we need to go further to make sure that the carbon that's produced uh, from, the, from this policy uh, not be used for that purpose, you know, we can talk more about that. Um, but there is, you know, that would of course fly in the face of, of the goals uh, of this. Um, I think uh, there's no evidence that there's uh, any support from the oil industry, whether those be drillers, or certainly we heard uh, enough evidence from uh, representatives of traditional fuel sources uh, in opposition to this bill. Um, you know, so clearly they don't think that their fortunes are improved by uh, the use of this bill. And I just, I will continue to state and maintain um, that, uh, you know, we, we have to address climate change more quickly than we are today uh, in the transportation sector. And some of the uh, propon uh, some of the opponents who said we're on a path already, uh, and then by their own numbers, uh, cited percentages that simply are insufficient uh, to address uh, the climate crisis uh, that we have. And this moves us in that direction in a way that promotes and builds. Um, you know, uh, greater uh, products and services and economic opportunities uh, for the state. It just reminds me a lot uh, of when we were at the threshold of the discussions on the renewable energy standard as well as our conservation and efficiency measures when we took significant steps forward uh, in modernized uh, efficiency and conservation in the utility sector uh, 10 or so years ago. Um, with that, um, uh, thank you. Yes. Uh, I'm ready to respond to questions if we still uh, have energy at 6.20 to uh, pose questions and enter thoughts. Questions from members. Senator Howe. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I think this is uh, quite an, uh, an aggressive, an aggressive uh, proposition. Uh, and I've got a number of questions, but I'm just going to ask the, the one that is probably the most, if, if we went to 100% renewable fuels today, you know, if we could flip the switch and do it today, what effect on the world's climate would we have? What temp, how much temperature would we drop or gain or what effect would it have if Minnesota flipped the switch or the United States flipped the switch today? What effect on the world's climate would we have? Because the climate is global. And so we're 4% of the popula world's population in the United States. So if we could flip the switch today, what's, what's the reduction in the temperature that we're going to have globally? Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, you know, I don't know the answer to that question, um, but uh, this is a conversation that we had a lot uh, when we first started contemplating whether or not Minnesota should do anything in the utility sector and you know uh, all the other sectors to reduce its contribution uh, to greenhouse gases, uh, to carbon, and the like. Um, and uh, you know, the the truth is, uh, everywhere in the world is only X percent of the their country's population or X percent of the, you know, we don't have a global government so that, you know, someone can wave a magic wand and, you know, and cause, um, you know, and cause these policy shifts. We have to do what we can uh, where we are. Um, but I also wanted to speak to another aspect of your question, which is flip the switch today. There is no flipping of any switches that can occur that would cause, I mean, we, we're just not ready. You know, I just bought an electric vehicle and I can tell you, 
Um, I only use it to tootle around town and pretty much just do my charging at home because there's just not a charging, enough charging infrastructure even around town for me to access much less if I want to go to you know, Rochester in the dead of winter or you know, places beyond. Um, and so there's going to be a lot of people who aren't ready um, to purchase an electric vehicle for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is they're a little bit more expensive, you have to put in a charging infrastructure, um, and plus you don't have that kind of transportation security. So people are going to be buying um, uh, you know, traditional fuel vehicles or high, you know, hybrids or, or, or like that. And so we need to gain, uh, and also we just, you know, that, you know, we just, so that we don't cause uh, economic effects that dislocate people. Um, you know, we've been talking about that for a long time. So we have uh, plans and programs to assist you, uh, whole communities, um, you know, like Becker, when uh, as, as the uh, turbines go offline and they, and they transition the, the power plant up there. Um, you know, we recognize that there's a lot of consequence for communities and jobs and professions, et cetera. And so uh, we need to be mindful of those effects. I want to make one other point, Madam Chair, and that's on this price of fuel. If, if you I testify to, and it's in the bill, if you look, um, you know, I don't anticipate that the, the, the consequence um, to, to gas prices um, will be great. Um, but um, if you look at, um, you know, line 3.27, um, uh, you know, we create uh, a, a consideration of that should it happen if the, if the cost exceeds the benefit similar to what we did and what we've done in energy efficiency as well as renewable, renewable energy standard. Senator Howe. Thank you, Madam Chair. And so I'll, I'll leave that and uh, I'll go to the agriculture sector. Uh, you know, you're, you're putting a lot into no-till and the farmers that I've, I, in my district, there's some that are, there's very few that are completely no-till and many of them are have small plots and small areas where they try no-till and they're still experimenting. And keep in mind that no-till is very specialized equipment. Some of it they're still manufacturing, they're, they're, they're making it themselves, a lot of it. So to push them that fast and that far, uh, it's one, it's very expensive equipment uh, and and it's some of it work. Some of the no-till no-till experiments work. Some of it doesn't, and that's why many don't put their whole farm into it, because depending upon what kind of weather they have, really affects what kind of an outcome they have, and it's their livelihood. So to push them all that way this fast, I'm concerned you're going to have a we're going to it's gonna have a dramatic effect on farmers' economy and their livelihoods and being able to actually sustain it. Uh, so I, I, I think we're, we're moving relatively fast, especially on the agricultural committee uh, uh, front. I, I, what, is there a reason why we're specifically going no-till and, and I, I understand that there, there is some Folks, but it, the folks that I've talked to that have went no-till actually lose production, and if, but they get less time in the field, which they get, I guess, better family time. But to me, less production means we're feeding less people. Senator Devon. Well, uh, first of all, we're not pushing anyone to do anything, uh, Senator Howell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, this is, you know, if a, if a farmer wants to grow, uh, you know, a biofuel feedstock, that's entirely up to them. Uh, and if they want to do so uh, with, you know, what we call uh, soil healthy farming practices, or if they want to make use of uh, continuous living cover cropping systems, um, uh, they can do so or not. Uh, if they choose to do so, they would get uh, a little extra credit. Uh, for for engaging in those sorts of farming practices in the credit system that we've developed. So there's no requirement, A, that anyone participate in any aspect of this program whatsoever, and B, that they, that they use uh, soil healthy farming practices, which are more than uh, no-till. It's reduced tillage, conservation tillage, 
cover cropping, perennial cropping, inner seeding, organic production, manure management, roller crimping, managed rotational grazing, precision agricultural crop rotations, and, and changes in, in grazing management, among others. Um, and likewise, you know, the continuous living cover uh, cropping system, um, you know, means that folks uh, can can use those those cropping systems that uh, you know cover the ground uh, throughout the year um, for the purpose of holding the soil in place, sequestering carbon, um, you know, using it for forage and past in pasture, um, and and transitioning over to some of these potentially really really exciting. Uh, uh, seed crops that that are available to uh, create uh, different forms of of sources for uh, biodiesel and others like uh, winter camelina and pennycress. So we're not pushing anyone to do anything. Follow up, Senator we're, we're creating an incentive. Thank you, Ma Madam Chair, and Senator Dibble. I, I, you know, a lot of those are great and, and good farming practices, and and I understand that. And but. When you say you're not pushing them towards it, if you're not using these, you get credit. If you use them, you get credits, and if you don't use them, you're going to be in the deficit mode. And and so to me, you're kind of getting pushed that direction. But on a, I guess uh, another question I have is: Have we looked at the grow houses and the greenhouses that use CO to to enhance their their growth? I was just at I was just at getting my uh, building official uh, continuing education courses, and I stuck my head into the cannabis deal, and I was able to hear that. Now, don't worry about the grow houses; they're just a greenhouse, and we have greenhouses all over the place. They're just going to—you'll have tanks outside pumping in CO to to help them with the, accelerate their growth. So, in that respect. Uh, you know, are we looking at any of those? Are the applications in our agricultural sector? Senator Dibble. Well, first, I, you know, I just have to go back to we're, we're not forcing anyone to use, you know, people would still be entitled to credits. It's whether or not they would have their credits enhanced through these practices. So I just need to make sure the record is quite clear. I'm not familiar with what you're talking about, and I'm not sure how that relates to the transportation sector, but, uh, you know, uh, you know, if it's a good thing and we're reducing uh, 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 carbon dioxide emissions or greenhouse gases, uh, and it has something to do with uh, uh, transportation fuel, um, you know, and they're part of the, the supply chain of producing and, and supplying uh, transportation fuel um, that brings our contribution to, green, to climate change down, you know, they'd be a part of the, of the program if they want to be. Other questions, members? Uh, Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and Senator Dibble, and, and I know your best intentions are in this bill, and, and we've, over the years, have agreed on a lot of things about more money for transportation. We agree on that. Unfortunately, uh, on this bill, I don't agree. Um, you know, the biggest thing I heard from a lot of testifiers were the increased cost to consumers, and I think that is really one of the big big points for me. Um, you know, everything that has to do with transport, transporting our goods across the state will be affected by this, I believe. And I do believe the gas prices will be affected by it. You look at the ones that have enacted something like this, and they're much higher than we are here in Minnesota. And I know Mr. Sexton commented, but there's a lot of different things that have influenced that. But looking at the map, to me, it sure seems the ones that have implemented something have much higher fuel costs. And remember, those fuel costs in the trucking industry costs go to everything. That's our foods, our goods. Uh, schools that have to pay more in, in school bus uh, fuel, uh, products being uh, brought across the state, it, it continues down to the, the taxpayers. And we all talk about inflation and inflation, how bad it is. Well, inflation is caused by regulation like this. The pr prices have to increase because you're putting new requirements on people. Uh, you've seen, I've seen the stuff from the CARB and, and how much you expect to see increases, uh, not only within the first couple of years, but over 10 years, and, and I think it really does affect. Uh, I also look at, uh, you know, Minnesota with the slower economic growth um, around the state. I have many friends from the military and college that are in different places and, and a comment about, you know, what's going on in Minnesota, and I wouldn't move there, and, and I see uh, I also have been involved with uh, architects and engineers who have businesses in, in other states, and they said that Minnesota is not 
growing like it should be because of, of all the regulation that we're seeing recently here in Minnesota. So that has a concern. Also going to the trucking industry, I have a good friend who owns Trelo Trucking in Medford, Notana, and talked to him about the cost of trucks and what that would do and, and electrification of that and increased costs and the cost, you know, I think Mr. Hausladen commented about a $200,000 tractor going to a $480,000 tractor. And you all talk about the goal of 100% at some point. So you are trying to basically ban uh, vehicles that, you know, have uh, gas and diesel in them over time. Uh, I also have, you know, many friends who have, you know, cars and, and they collect your cars and, and uh, they have those. And what's going to happen in 10 or 15 years from now if they have those vehicles? Will they have the access to gasoline? Will it be much more expensive? Uh, there's just lots of things, and we had great testimony uh, today here, or this evening, I should say. Uh, I, I just have some huge concerns of what it's going to do to our residents across Minnesota. I know we all want to reduce uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. I, I totally understand that. I think we're proceeding along that. I, I saw something about the CTS modeling estimates a 30% a carbon intensity reduction uh, is going to be achieved uh, already with things in place. Um, so me uh, thinking about that, just the increased cost to, to people, and I won't bullet go on and on, but that's my concerns. That's what I heard from the testifiers, uh, from the chamber, to the trucking association, to many, many more of concerns. Uh, that's the concerns I hear in my district as well. And, and I think being in a rural district in Minnesota, and I know you've traveled a lot with us on the bonding tour quite a bit for rural Minnesota, rural Minnesota is a lot different than the metropolitan area, and it affects people differently uh, from, a, from a school, a parent that has a, a child that's uh, participating in sports and they have to travel hundreds of miles to a sporting event uh, has a bigger effect on rural Minnesotans than it does in the metro. So all those things won't go on and on. Uh, we've had a long hearing today and lots of great testimony, but uh, those are my concerns. Uh, so thank you for listening, and I don't know if you want to comment or not, but those are my concerns, and I think that's what we're hearing from a lot of people. Chair Dibble, any comments? I am going to make it my mission to win Senator Jasinski over. <laughs> uh, Senator Carlson. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I have a couple of things that I need to say. One of, one of them is that Minnesota is actually growing faster than a lot of the states around us, and that's one of the reasons why a few days ago we heard that we actually have a, an increase in the forecast so, because we have more people working, we have more businesses paying taxes, we have more people buying things and paying sales taxes. So it's not true that we're behind the eight ball. And in my case, uh, I represent Egan in uh, Burnsville, and right next to us is Rosemount. And there's a billion dollars worth of investment going on in Rosemount in the uh, the former University of Minnesota lands, and it's a it's two data data uh, um, corporations that are going to one of them is Apple or yeah one of them is Apple one of them is Meta, and they're investing tons of money in Minnesota. So they th the estimate is continuing, and we do know that uh, you know in next to it is uh, uh, Flint Hills, which has been investing for quite some time and and isn't planning on stopping because. Uh, uh, Minnesota is very friendly to uh, Flint Hills. But I do want to say, you know, that we did hear a little bit about that price increase and also the price of gasoline among amongst uh, states. And, you know, Minnesota is, I uh, just looked it up here, and uh, Minnesota is an average of uh, $3.16. Uh, Wisconsin is actually higher than us, $3.27. Uh, you know, California is higher. I visit California a lot because that's where my grandson lives. And, <clears throat> and, you know, they have been ahead of us on improvements of air for a long time. I used to go out there in the 80s, and, you, you know, sunset was really um, smog. Today, they don't have smog. It's clear. It's, it's amazing the difference that they have achieved in, uh, in air clarity or air quality. But I do want to ask uh, Senator Dibble about one thing, and you mentioned the, um, now I probably uh, am going to lose it here, but uh, yeah, um, the section two on page, or uh, line 3.27, consider the cost of compliance with clean transportation fuel standard. And I'm wondering, there's, a, there's something that we did back years ago where we talked about an off-ramp. 
do you see this as an off ramp? What is when do we pull the plug on something, or when do we we say, okay, this uh, really isn't working out the way we planned, and we may have to make some significant changes? Do you have a feel for off ramps, Senator? Um, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, um, uh, uh, Senator Carlson. Um, uh, well, that you know, I mean, th that's probably a, an area in which we need to um, have more conversation and see if we, you know, need to give more. You know, a lot of what we do, and that this is another crit critique and criticism of the bill. That I don't know if I heard too much um, in the testimony today, but have received a lot of that in conversations with folks in my office, and that is how much we offload to um, the Department of Transportation. Um, uh, to to uh, write the rules for some of the particulars around um, how the program is designed and administered and enforced and the like. Um, you know, I'm I'm not an opponent of rulemaking, um, and you know, I'll also say in in somewhat of a response, um, you know, there's a lot of mechanisms that we can build in uh, to make sure those rules are written in a way that meet our expectations as a legislature. We can bring them back. We can delay their effective date. Um, you know, and of course we can change and amend any rule um, through, through, uh, th through statute that, that we like. Um, you know, we probably need to create a little bit more specificity around, you know, the off ramps and soft landings and, you know, and uh, keeping an eye towards the, the implications that have been articulated here as a key concern. Um, but yes, I mean, this is where, where I'm looking to as, a, as an off-ramp or soft landing or, you know, making sure that the costs uh, and the benefits are aligned with each other. Senator Carlson. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Dibble. I just want to remind people that we had that off-ramp back in uh, whatever it was, 2007, and that was for our uh, our um, let's say our plan to have more wind energy and we needed an off-ramp and so we did in, you know, institute an off-ramp that was if you know because everybody thought we would not be able to buy enough uh, wind turbines uh, that wind turbine blades would be hard to get uh, the uh, transmission would be hard to set up and actually we never had to use that off-ramp it we really you know, people stepped up and we actually got ahead of the uh, plan for a while. So off ramps are good, but they give people a little bit more comfort if we have them, and then hopefully we wouldn't have to use them. So thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Coleman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senator Dibble, I'm, I'm happy to hear you're open to the idea of off ramps. My big concern is if the technology isn't there, the technology isn't there, and what's our plan moving forward? Um, furthermore, you and I spent the summer and fall working on a working group together, and I know we appreciate what comes out of working groups, uh, but the working group had less aggressive recommendations, and the state's hired consultant had less aggressive recommendations. And so my concern is, with this bill being more aggressive than what they thought was feasible, does this put us down a road where future legislatures are having to mandate electric vehicles or you know, close our state's ethanol and biodiesel facilities. How far is this willing to go, I guess, is my question. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, so some who are opposed to this bill want us to mandate electric vehicles. <laughs> and so this, and this bill takes a different approach, which is creating a, you know, a market-based incentive uh, mechanism. And also, by the way, uh, creating a tremendous amount of resources um, to help people um, electrify or move to, you know, alternatives um, as well. Um, I'll just point out that, uh, um, you know, uh, if you look at uh, Section 2, starting on line 3.12, um, we do create a couple of benchmarks in, in paragraph B, starting in paragraph B, uh, you know, with the 25% and 75%. The 75% is probably a little aggressive, and these are... Um, you know, these are, are um, standards as opposed to goals, but the 100% but the uh, uh, reduction by 2050 is, is articulated as a goal. And that's a recognition that what we know today, uh, given the me this mechanism as well as the available technology, um, that getting to 100% by 2050 is probably going to be pretty hard. That's how we started out as well. We started out in the renewable 
uh, energy standard as a as a goal um, because we didn't know how quickly and, and how and what the cost benefit uh, metrics would be um, and then we quickly to Senator Carlson's point uh, found out that uh, this was enough of a signal to the market uh, to innovate um, and to create uh, uh, Resource, you know, it, it created resources. This is also true in the efficiency and conservation measures that we took. That I was the chief author of. We had the off ramps and the soft landings, uh, uh, and and we articulated everything as as goals. Um, and uh, and if they were unach unachievable uh, through the cost benefit analysis, um, those utilities could could petition out or you know get out of those uh, requirements. And we found out very quickly in both arenas that um, it created. A lot of innovation created a lot of economic activity, a lot of jobs, uh, and saved people a lot of money. Keep in mind, this, this, this overall uh, policy proposal gives a lot more consumer choice. Um, and, and in particular, uh, you know, credits are generated. Um, utilities will be gaining some resources to the tune of over $100 million per year, um, the purpose for which would be used to expend on assisting people uh, with buying electric vehicles and putting in place electric charging infrastructure. There is no other proposal that even comes close to generating that kind of resource in anything I've heard from anyone ever. Um, you know, we're not going to be putting, you know, 100, 200 plus million dollars per year in, in tax money towards that purpose. I don't anticipate and I don't think there's enough resource in utility programs to you know, as we know them now, to generate that kind of resource for that purpose, 60% of which is targeted at those communities that are not well served, rural communities uh, and, and underserved communities. Senator Coleman, follow-up. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Dibble. Can you please walk me through again how the consumer protections work as far as the gas prices or if this leads to increased prices in goods? Senator um, Dibble. So, uh, as I said, um, you know, the, uh, so the, um, uh, the, the commissioner uh, of transportation has to um, adopt rules, uh, you know, and, and part of, of what uh, the rules adopted uh, must include provisions that allow for adjustments to the credit market in response to either uh, evidence that credit prices are impacting retail fuel prices um, or, of course, you know, on the other end, uh, the need to maintain um, you know, a value in that market so that innovation, so that there's an a, a economic signal that shows that uh, um, there's value in, in spurring innovation. Um, uh, yeah. Go ahead, Mr. Jordan. Ms. Jordan has more uh, to expand on that. I'll also just say that um, as the uh, rules are, are developed, um, there's a number of other uh, really important um, elements that, that they have to adhere to. First of all, of, of, you know, a, a, a fairly broad uh, group of people is brought together um, that is named uh, on line 4.19 advisory committee that represents lots and lots of different representatives from different sectors. Uh, and then there are set forth are 10 uh, uh, goals uh, in the development of this program. Um, broad rural and urban uh, economic development, benefits for communities, consumers, clean fuel providers, technology providers, feedstock suppliers. Um, increasing energy security, equitable trans transportation, electrification, uh, improved air quality and public health, targeting communities that, dis that bear disproportionate health burden, um, and, and, and it goes on from there. So, uh, and it has to be um, the result of extensive outreach to stakeholders and communities that bear disproportionate burden from pollution from transportation, protects our environment, um, you know, et cetera. So, so a lot of co-benefits um, are mandated into the de development, design, and administration enforcement of this program. But Mr. Jordan had more to add as well on the specific question you have. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Senator Coleman, uh, Brendan Jordan uh, with the Great Plains Institute. I'll just draw your attention to subdivision four, starting at line 5.22. Uh, uh, rules adopted by the commissioner under this section must include provisions that allow for adjustments to the credit market in response to either demonstrated evidence that credit prices are impacting retail fuel prices or the need to maintain a sufficient credit price to spur further innovation in the clean fuels market. It further uh, 
uh, allows uh, evaluation uh, and adjustments to the to credit prices to minimi minimize uh, consumer impacts as well in the uh, following section. Senator Coleman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, when you say consumer impact, does that con include consumer of all goods impacted by fuel or just fuel prices? Mr. Jordan. Uh, uh, Chair Senator Coleman, uh, it just refers to minimizing any impacts to consumers caused by increased retail fuel prices. Senator Coleman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. My, my concern is I, I want to make sure that we're considering everything that's going to be impacted here by the cost of increased fuel prices because I certainly hear from my constituents every single week that they're at the breaking point and I would hate for this legislature to do anything more to tip them over that point. So I hope we sincerely move with caution and off ramps and consumer protections because otherwise I'm not sure how many more of my constituents will be able to remain in the state of Minnesota. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Howe. Thank you, Madam Chair. One more question. I, I'm, I'm looking at the deficit generation fee and looking at lines 11.14 where 95% of the budget uh, of the clean transportation fuel standard program needs to be paid by the deficit generators and then 5% by the, by the credit generators. It doesn't look like there's any limit there and it looks like the commissioner can set that anywhere he wants or anywhere, anywhere they want and they can hire as many FTEs they can do. Is there any thought about putting any restrictions on this anywhere or is it because uh, it doesn't look doesn't really look like there's any any guardrails to prevent that from going awry and and uh, really uh, having an impact on on the costs that we we're talking. Senator Dibble. Thank you. Um, uh, that's a fair point, and uh, I agree with you. Um, you know, we we probably should take a closer look at this. I mean, we we do have a fiscal note that was prepared. On the previous version of the bill, this is, of course, just to be clear, this is uh, around just the, the development of the program and, and then the ongoing uh, maintenance and running of, of the program. Um, all the activities that go into creating the, you know, if assessing the, the carbon intensity, you know, receiving that information on an annual basis, ramping down. Um, the level of you know acceptable contribution of greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere over time, um, making sure that there's a, a functional credit market, uh, et cetera. So there's a lot of activities, and also the enforcement, you know, the validation and enforcement pieces. So, and uh, I think it was uh, you know thought to be around a uh, million dollars or something like that. Um, but um, but you're right, you know, it, it probably this section probably would need to be buttoned up before this is ready for final action and passage with your enthusiastic support because we figured it out. <laughs> All right. Um, I have two, I think, fairly brief questions just as a matter of clarification. Um, it is my understanding that the GREET model uh, carbon intensity, that CI, but my question is, does it model also non-climate environmental impacts like air pollution, uh, waste pollution, water depletion, other, other impacts? I'll let the scientist answer. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so the, the, the GREED model used for the implementation of the program focuses on climate pollution. Actually, the, the folks at, at Argonne Labs have looked at various other things, so it's certainly possible to do that. Uh, uh, I think, although typically when people have uh, done studies of air pollution from these kinds of policies, they've used different different tools, different models for that. So. So the carbon intensity score would be primarily based on uh, the CO2 pollution and uh, additional studies would probably use different tools. Okay, thank you. And my second question is around ethanol consumption. There's been a fair bit of um, discussion about that. Um, can you um, just talk a little bit about the expected um, change, if any, in amount of ethanol consumption um, if this plan were to be enacted? Uh, so... <laughs> So, you know, um, th this is just a point, I think, in which there's just a, a different 
perspective or just you know just a disagreement uh, among the environmental organizations. Um, I believe the evidence supports the claim that uh, you know as carbon intensity uh, you know is 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 reduced um, and you know ethanol as we know is used in conjunction with traditional fossil fuels uh, with with petroleum um, that um, that it will go down and it will go down faster than than it would otherwise. That causes a lot of people in this room to oppose the bill for that purpose. The claim is made by some groups uh, that the opposite is the case, that this is somehow artificially extending the life of fossil fuels and, and ethanol that goes with it. I just think the opposite is, is true, but you know, let, let my partners here respond if they have a, a, a better um, way of responding to that question. Sure. Uh, Jeremy Martin, Union of Concerned Scientists. I'll add that, I mean, I've been following you know, the ethanol markets and gasoline markets in fuel policies for the last 15 years. And, you know, I think what's, what's really clear is that it's the, it's the vehicles, right? There was the big transition to E10 that happened in conjunction with the RFS had a huge impact. And really, that was the big change. And since then, uh, you know, ethanol and gasoline have gone hand in hand. Uh, I think at this point, the prospects for, you know, a big departure off of that for, for automakers suddenly shifting to different kinds of vehicles, that moment has passed, right? And I, I think the prospects for uh, big increases in ethanol blending are, are gone. And so, you know, at this point, the big question is, you know, how much ethanol used is almost entirely determined by how much gasoline is used. And so, so frankly, you know, how much people drive has more to do with how much ethanol use than, than these kinds of policies. So, you know, so the question is how quickly can we reduce the amount of gasoline use? And of course, that's also to not take too myopic a focus. There's a number of concerns about ethanol. There's enormous concerns about gasoline. And so reducing those two together is really the, the, the focus of this policy. Uh, and you know, to do that, we need to replace it with cleaner fuels. And, and that's what this policy is all about. Thank you. All right, uh, Chair Dibble, thank you uh, for bringing this bill. We've had good discussion. Any closing comments? Um, no, I, I just wanted to respond to a couple of things quickly um, because uh, I got in a few phone of friends here. Um, so I just want to button up some responses to Senator Howe. Um, you know, to my point that you know the, the fees that run the program um, do need to be constrained. There's probably more work to be done, but uh, just to just to let you know, if you look at lines 10.20 to 22, um, the total amount of the fees have to cannot exceed the, the cost of running the program. What the cost of running the program is is something we probably should talk more about. Um, absolutely, um, I, I get that. Um, and then uh, again, you know, I, I think I, as I presented the bill, um, um, I believe this will take us further and faster in ultimately eliminating greenhouse gases uh, from the transportation sector. Um, you know, that, you know, Senator Jasinski, I'll own that. That's true. Um, you know, what happens with some of the, you know, uh, collector vehicles and things like that, we'd, we'd have to talk about. I don't have a good response for that right now. Um, but uh, um, the other thing to keep in mind, too, is, you know, those fuels that are being uh, produced uh, and distributed and utilized um, that, that put us you know, move us away from, you know, by the carbon intensity measure from our greenhouse gas reduction goals. There, even within those, there are incentives that are, that are created to bring the carbon intensity measures down, even at uh, an operation like Flint Hills or Marathon. You know, if, if they were to um, use some uh, means of production um, that draws on renewable energy, for example. At, you know, I know that, for example, Flint Hills is very proud of the fact that they're putting some a solar installation, you know, things like that that reduce their, their, their uh, energy intensity in the production of the fuel um, that they produce. That would gain them uh, some consideration in this program and in this system, likewise with biofuels. We talked about the ag practices and others, but there's lots of other ways too um, to bring the carbon intensity measures down just through the production, delivery, and utilization of those fuels. Uh, and they would, 
either reduce um, you know the credits that would, they would have to pay into or, or, the, or increase the credits that they would receive for that activity. So this is unleashing very powerful economic and market tools um, and then also to generate resources that, that are in, in orders of magnitude uh, far beyond anything that anyone is talking about or contemplating that's realistic. So, you know, I, I'm very proud of this package. You know, I think there's still a lot more. The last word has not been spoken. There's a lot of folks uh, uh, that still have to collaborate and confer and, and figure out because everyone brings up really, really good points. Um, but I think it's definitely worth continuing to debate and discuss and consider uh, and try to move forward at some point. Thank you, Madam Chair. Very good. Thank you very much. So with that, Senate File 2584 uh, will be laid over. As amended, will be laid over. Um, and members, before we conclude, I'm going to turn to Ms. Ethier to talk about uh, the remainder of the week. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I would let you know that on Wednesday afternoon, we are currently hearing three bills. Uh, one is a pedestrian active transportation bill from Senator Bolden. Uh, we'll be hearing a speed safety camera enforcement bill from Senator Mohammed, and a, uh, a, the Trunk Highway 7 Corridor Coalition bill from Senator Morrison. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, members, with no further business before us, we are adjourned. Thank you.